Housing Authority and the Concord Select Board. Uh, we have the purpose of this meeting is to appoint a temporary Concord Housing Association member to fill the vacancy. Uh, we are required to begin by uh, doing a roll call. So if you just announce your name and say here. Mike Lawson, here. Linda Late, but here. <laughs> Linda Escobedo, here. Alice Kaufman, here. Tom McCain here. Rick Eifler here. Edward Larner here. Hester Schnipper. And Todd Benjamin, member of the CHA, present. So we do have quorums necessary. Um, we are operating under Mass General Laws Section 11, appointment to fill a vacancy in town office. As used in this section, the term vacancy includes a failure to elect if a vacancy occurs in any town office other than the office of selectman, town clerk, treasurer, collector, taxes, or auditor, the selectman shall in writing appoint a person to fill such vacancy. If there's a vacancy in the board consisting of two or more members, except the board whose members have been elected by proportional representation under Chapter 54A, the remaining members shall give written notice thereof within one month of said vacancy to the selectman who with the remaining member or members of such board shall after one week's notice fill such vacancy by roll call vote. The selectman shall then fill a vacancy if the board fails to give such notice within the time herein specified. The majority of the vote of the officers entitled to vote shall be necessary to such election. The person so appointed or elected shall be a registered voter in the town and shall perform the duties of the office until the next annual meeting or until another is qualified. So we I believe the um, Housing Authority has just met and they will give their report at this time. Um, the Housing Authority had a meeting at uh, 6 o'clock, a public meeting at 6 o'clock to consider um, three candidates for the vacant seat. Um, all three had submitted green cards to the town expressing interest in the Housing Authority. And uh, we discussed the candidates and uh, reviewed the information they submitted. And the board voted to recommend Fatima Mezda to, uh, for the vacant seat. Um, does any of the members of the select board have any questions regarding? I would just um, like to comment that I also think the under um, DHCD's um, statutes and regulations. They also um, have a process uh, similar to what you read in terms of filling this vacancy. So I just want to be sure that that's on the record. And they're actually filling the vacancy that you left. That's right. Um, I believe then, do we have a, um, uh, a motion? Um, under section two. So I'd be happy to make a motion, but I think I need some assistance again with the name of the person. <laughs> Can I have a copy of that name? And address, perhaps? Let's find well, it. I will find it. Oh. We may have a copy as well. There it is. Whoever gets to it right. first. <laughs> okay. Well, that's her letter of interest. And this is her green card information. Uh, okay. So um, in a roll call vote with the Concord Housing Authority to appoint, so this is a motion to appoint Fatima Mezdad to fill the vacancy position on the Concord Housing Authority. The term of the vacancy is until the dissolution of the, of the 2019 annual town meeting. Go around a uh, vote. Second. Uh, and uh, Second. we need to do this uh, in a roll call fashion. So. Aye. 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 I think that um, that accomplishes our goal and um, we did 
adjourn at this time. I take a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much for your work and uh, for your continual work. <laughs> I'm going to allow a couple of minutes for those who were here just for this somewhat unusual uh, fashion of uh, uh, it had to do with uh, filling a vacancy in an elected position, and that's why the formality is somewhat different than uh, somebody being appointed to a uh, committee or uh, uh, a board. Are we, are we staying in here? Is that we're staying in here. of us for the regular meeting. Yeah, I'll li I'll lift up on me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, usually there's cushions. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell Chuck later. Yeah, there, is a, there is a cushion on the chair over there. Do, would you like, would, do you want me to get that? Or, I'm happy to. You sure? I will now call to order the regular meeting of the um, Concord Select Board for June 4th, 2018. Uh, remind people that when you, um, if you're going to address 
the meeting, make sure you, you identify yourself, name and address, and keep your voice up. I think they've done a certain amount of work here, but the acoustics are not perfect, and your back will be to the crowd, so we, as much as possible, would like everybody to be able to hear. Uh, we will begin with the consent agenda. I would point out, uh, Jane Hotchkiss, uh, select board member is going to be coming a little bit later. She has a graduation celebration of a family member and uh, she's at that and uh, uh, we didn't want to prevent her from celebrating the graduation so uh, she's going to come as soon as she's able. Uh, consent agenda, the gift acceptance, Middlesex Savings Bank, $500 to the Harvey Wheeler Centennial Celebration gift account and the Boston Foundation, $2,500 to the Thomas Curtin Bobby Cargula Nani gift account. We're very appreciative of those gifts. One day special licenses, Kathy Clute for July 14th, 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., 11 Wheeler Road, Wine and Malt, Salt Box Farm, June 15th, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., 40 Westfield Road, Wine and Malt, Concord Academy, June 8, 9, and 10, noontime until 10 p.m., 166 Main Street, all alcohol. <coughs> uh, we also have two proclamations, one for um, Fenn School Headmaster, Jerry Ward, retirement, and the other Concord historian, Jane Gooden, retirement. Both of those are going to be read at uh, their retirement parties. And I want to thank those who assisted in uh, getting the information for the proclamations. Uh, we also have Sunday Entertainment License, 51 Walden, Inc., June 10th, 2 to 5 p.m. at 51 Walden Street, Opera and tour guide renewals. Now I guess we're ready um, for, uh, there you are, we. I move you to approve the consent yeah. agenda as read. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, town manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> We have a special municipal election coming up on Tuesday, June 12th. The town will be voting uh, to consider approving a bylaw adopted by town meeting in April, which would prohibit recreational marijuana sales in Concord and other marijuana-related businesses. Uh, most communities in our area, area have adopted such bylaws. Uh, the building inspector's office is open in the e Tuesday evenings now. They started last week, I think, uh, to answer um, questions from residents and builders um, and to provide some evening hours that people might find more convenient. So they'll be open till 8 p.m. on Tuesdays. It will have one, at least one building inspector available to answer questions. Um, summer hours for town offices. Um, uh, many of the town offices, particularly the planning office and the townhouse, will close at noon on Fridays, as we have for about eight years in the past. Uh, employees work a, a longer, either a longer day, the uh, Monday through Thursday, uh, and leave at noon on Friday, or take paid vacation on the, the half day on Fridays. And that will start the last Friday of June, June 29th, and will end on August 31st. Um, the assistant town manager reported that there were 13 proposals received from consultants interested in um, doing the park planning for the Giro land should the um, acquisition go through. Um, uh, there were mostly local firms, lots of experience, so we have good um, planners and funds were appropriated as part of the appropriation of funds um, for, uh, by town meeting last April. Uh, the Assabet River Canoe Landings, the NRC is um, in the process of constructing, um, and we'll be hearing tomorrow, to, uh, Wednesday night, uh, applications to consider constructing two new canoe landings, uh, one near the TD Bank, um, near the Assabet Bridge, uh, Assabet River Bridge, and the other one near the Second Division Brook uh, near Route 62 in the Damon Mill. So two new uh, canoe landings are under consideration. Um, Hanscom wanted to let us know that uh, on June 15th, they are having a fireworks display on the base. There's nothing out of the ordinary. No, no neighbors shouldn't be up. The sky lights up, don't be worried. It's, it's not a concern. They're having an uh, on-base uh, celebration. Um, Public Works uh, reports the Lowell Road was milled last week um, and will be resurfaced. The plan is for that to be Thursday and Friday of this week uh, to resurface Lowell Road. 
um, recycling. There was some report in the New York Times that uh, communities are tra throwing away their recyclable products. Uh, we are not doing that. We uh, do have that dual stream recycling paper and plastics and, and glass. Therefore, we have a market for our recyclables and are still um, able to get some money from those. Uh, Public Works will also host its third annual bike giveaway on uh, June 20th. Uh, those are the bicycles that are dropped off at the drop-off swap of event, off events uh, during the year. They're re rehab rehabbed. Um, some of the bike sh local bike shop owners and uh, town staff rehab those bikes. And um, uh, pre-registration is required because it's a popular event and there's probably more interest than there are bikes available. But it's a chance to uh, get a good bike, so contact the Public Works Department about that. Um, and lastly, it may be necessary for Public Works to, uh, to take, get a crane to remove two large trees that are in the Assabet River that fell in the, during that March storm where they're completely obstructing the, the passage of uh, uh, watercraft on the, on the river, uh, one near Assabet Avenue and one near the bridge uh, over the Assabet River. So, uh, uh, second annual Middlesex Jazz Fest is next uh, this Saturday, June 9th. Starts at 1. Uh, first band will start playing at uh, 1.30, and I think there are eight bands in all. Uh, new wireless uh, communication systems are being installed in this room and in the select board room, so uh, both the board and the public will have better wireless service than you've had in the past. Uh, the library had a great uh, day for a book sale on Saturday, and a new record was set of over $23,000. Um, uh, the Friends of the Library um, organized that event, and um, they donate the, the proceeds to uh, support library programs. That's all I have. No, I would just comment on the milling of Lowell Road. That it was the most efficient process that I've ever seen. They, they were Great. in and out of there in two days. It was Great. really amazing. And the election is, uh, the hours are 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. That, that's correct, yep. Uh, I just have a couple of comments. Um, Concord is a wonderful community wherein we respect diversity and diverse opinions. We've conducted a long-range plan, had numerous board and committees with the goal of respectful self-government. As would be the case with any group of people, we have our occasional differences. On two occasions in the past couple of months, the issue of placing poison on private land has arisen. On the first occasion, a resident of Concord posted signs indicating that poison had been placed on his property to notify those walking on paths abutting his property. On the second occasion, a Concord resident notified the animal control officer that she had placed poison on her private property. After the first notice, a concerned citizen called town officials to question whether placement of poison on private property was permitted by law. The State Environmental Police has indicated that pursuant to Chapter 131, Section 43, only placing poison in a container for the poisoning of mice and rats is allowed without a permit. Both parties have been notified of the law. There are two ways to view this situation. Either both parties were ignorant of the law and hopefully will be more careful to check before taking such action in the future. The other is that the parties knew their actions would cause anxiety among those who walked their dogs in the vicinity of their property and were trying to send a message. The second opinion, uh, options, unfortunately, in my opinion, is the more likely situation, and I would ask the parties to cease such behavior. It reflects poorly on both. I would call it childish, except the children would know better and it would be an insult to the children. I hope you will reflect and realize it demeans you. On a more positive note, I want to thank the Concord Garden Club for their plantings in front of the townhouse. The beauty of their plant enriches all those who enter the building and enhances all our lives, albeit in a small way. Secondly, I want to give a wag of the tail to the students who participated on Memorial Day in the Public Ceremonies Committee events, playing musical instruments, particularly to Alexis Kirkpatrick, who twice sang the national anthem, better than I think I've ever heard. A beautiful voice, perfect articulation, and just the right tempo. It was truly uplifting and it made the Memorial Day celebration very special. When I see young people like these with their poise and talent, I'm reinforced in my opinion for the future. 
and perhaps all the more disappointed with the behavior of some of the supposed adults. We now move on to um, the update on Verizon Emerson Umbrella Wireless Facility Proposal. Just identify yourselves and uh, uh, where you're representing. Yes, uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, staff. Uh, my name is Earl Duvall, and I'm counsel for Verizon Wireless. And I'm Dave Tivden, real estate for Verizon Wireless. And this is an update, a follow up uh, from the meeting that you had with us, I believe, January 22nd, correct? Yes. Correct. Fire away. <laughs> Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. See if I can push the correct button here. Ah. All right, uh, Mr. Chairman, as you know, the town of Concord had issued an RFP uh, for the Umbrella Arts Building at 40 Stowe Street. Uh, Verizon Wireless um, was a successful bidder um, on that RFP. Um, the next step in that process would be for the town to enter into lease negotiations uh, with Verizon Wireless. Um, when we were in last, uh, we were asked to look at um, another location uh, in town, uh, t another town-owned property, and we were also asked to look at three different uh, churches uh, that are in town. So what we did is we put together a um, brief PowerPoint presentation just to walk through uh, those efforts. So if I can, just because it might be easier for the board, I do have paper copies here. So if I may, the first slide here was prepared by the town's consultant, Ivan Paginik, and he uh, presented and discussed this slide at the last uh, meeting. And I just wanted to put this up first just so that if there are those in attendance that hadn't seen this, they can look to see what um, it is that Verizon Wireless is trying to do. If you look at this map, let's see if I... Uh, these areas, these yellow circles that have blue around those, those are existing sites where uh, Verizon Wireless is propagating from. Uh, this area here in the middle uh, that's you know, white and green, this is the area in which uh, Verizon Wireless has what we refer to as a significant gap in coverage. They do not have uh, reliable coverage. Again, um, rather than us you know, prepare, Verizon Wireless prepare this map, the town's consultant uh, prepared this map uh, on behalf of the town. Uh, the next slide is just a Google map showing the uh, different areas that we looked at. The uh, uh, Emerson, I mean the uh, umbrella is here. Uh, we were asked to look at the Emerson Field and then these three other locations are the three uh, different churches uh, that we looked at. Holy Family, Family Parish, and the uh, Trinitarian Church. Uh, so the first is the... Um, Emerson Field. Uh, so f familiar with the field here, there's an existing flagpole here. The thought was, could we replace that existing flagpole with a uh, unipole? Um, the the uh, circles here, this is a 300 foot radius and then a 500 foot radius just to demonstrate the uh, distances to uh, the uh, adjoining or abutting streets and residences. Uh, this photograph uh, is the existing condition. Uh, you can see the uh, flagpole uh, here. The next slide is uh, a depiction of a 120-foot unipole. So what the unipole is, uh, is a, oops, let me go back here, is a, uh, a stealth pole where uh, Verizon wireless antennas would be located inside uh, this structure. Uh, generally, with this type of technology, 
Verizon would install six antennas and they would take two uh, rad centers. So it's believed that with this type of structure, only one at 120 feet, only Verizon Wireless could locate there. Uh, the next uh, is increasing that just to give an idea as to, uh, because co-location uh, is favored, um, this is a 150 foot uh, structure in that place, which would allow for uh, potentially two carriers um, to co-locate there. Uh, this is just another view uh, looking down the path uh, to the existing uh, flagpole. Uh, the first is showing the 120 feet, second uh, the 150 feet. Uh, the next, um, and again, we, we looked at the uh, Emerson Field um, uh, on request from the, uh, the town to see what that might look like. Uh, we did a site walk, visited it, and um, had that put together. Uh, so then we looked at the Holy Family uh, Parish first, and that's at 12 Monument Square, right next door. Uh, oops, wrong button. Uh, T-Mobile is currently installed um, here in the cupola, and there's not sufficient uh, space uh, for Verizon Wireless to co-locate there. It's only enough space for the one carrier. Uh, the next, we looked at the Trinitarian uh, con Congregational Church at 54 Walden Street. Um, uh, Sprint uh, is currently installed uh, there. Um, David reached out to the uh, church, and they are, uh, have no interest in leasing to any additional uh, carriers. Uh, next, we looked at the uh, First Parish Church, 20 Lexington Road. That uh, location, we're, we're, you can see the, uh, it's the belfry here. Uh, antennas, there's the bell here. It would be uh, not possible to locate those uh, antennas there and to have them uh, concealed. Uh, so that installation you know, would, not, would not work. Um, brings us, and I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the uh, Umbrella uh, Arts Building. So this is the Umbrella Arts Building. Uh, the, the proposal, or the RFP was issued to do a communications facility there in the uh, cupola. Um, the next four slides, uh, we had done a uh, site visit when we were looking at this uh, with the town's expert, um, Ivan, and we took photographs from that cupola looking out in all four directions uh, from that. So um, there's one uh, direction, another direction, another, and another. I think you can see um, two of the churches uh, here. Um, so you can, as you can see from that um, cupola, it has a, a very nice presence overlooking the, um, the community. Um, this is just a, a photo from the uh, rear of the building. Um, I think it's important to note that uh, a, a communications facility here with you know, the antennas uh, mounted inside that cupola would not change um, the appearance of the, the cupola. Um, unless you absolutely knew that they were there, um, you're not going to uh, see those uh, antennas. Uh, the equipment compound, um, there was a, a number of different locations that were discussed, uh, but it would be in the rear of the building and be located up against the building and, you know, uh, behind a, a secure, you know, locked fence uh, with Verizon's equipment. And the next slide, and I can't see those heights from here, but the reason this was part of the uh, draft lease exhibit that went along with the response to the RFP, and I included that just to give you an idea as to the antenna center line for the um, uh, uh, antennas there in the cupola. And it says the top of the antennas is 84 um, feet um, here. Uh, and, and I bring that up because the reason that 
the uh, proposed unipole is either 120 feet or 140 feet is because of the technology. Um, in order to conceal the antennas inside that pole, the antennas would need to be significantly smaller and the equipment that we are now putting with the antennas, uh, it's called a remote radio head. It brings the technology from the um, base station, which was generally at the, at the ground level, uh, up to the antennas, which provides for uh, a much better signal and much better coverage um, footprint uh, for the site. So we're able to accomplish that here uh, in the, the height of the cupola versus uh, we would not be able to accomplish that unless we were at uh, the 120 feet um, with the unipole. Uh, and again, the reason we went and showed the 150 is that um, if that was the desired um, location, then uh, 150 would allow uh, it, you know, for two carriers uh, in that unipole as opposed to one, and we wanted to be able to provide the, the visual uh, to that. Um, so, you know, I, I think also I would, I would want to, and, and I believe the board knows, but maybe for the benefit of the, the public, that, you know, this is early in the process. If, if Verizon Wireless and the town are able to, you know, negotiate uh, a lease, um, you know, with, uh, with terms and, and business terms were already submitted in the uh, proposal and accepted, but a lease that contained the, the um, you know, all the other terms and conditions, then the next step would be for us to file uh, with the zoning board. So we would file an application with the zoning board for special permit. I believe the application then also goes to the planning board. Uh, the town would you know, immediately retain its own independent expert to look at our um, filing to make sure that it's complete and to validate everything that it is that Verizon Wireless is presenting. And, and I think there are two, you know, or three very important things that get validated. Number one is there a need, um, you know, for the service. And, you know, we've, we've, we already have a map from the uh, consultant that was retained uh, saying that there is a gap in coverage here and that there's a need. Um, you know, number two would be, you know, whether or not any of those other sites, I don't know if I can get back there. Hmm. I don't know what to do now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was trying to get back to that initial coverage um, uh, map to look to see if any, if there was anything that could be done at any of those other sites to, to boost the capacity of those sites in order to fill in the coverage there. So the consultant would weigh in, you know, on that. Uh, and then, you know, the last issue that's, um, you know, that that is important to folks is the radio frequency emissions. Uh, Verizon Wireless would retain uh, a health physicist to prepare a report with regards to what those radio frequency emissions are. The town's consultant would look at those and, uh, you know, determine whether or not we were operating within the guidelines, you know, imposed by the, you know, the FCC. Um, now, if, you know, looking at these type of installations for you know, for as long as, as we have, you know, I think the consultant would say we would still be, or I know the consultant would say we, we would still be well within the limits of any radio frequency emissions from those antennas um, if you had a hundred of those installations, you know, in that um, cupola. Um, and, and as the, the board is well versed and as the, uh, the zoning board and, and others, you know, there's some significant restrictions that are, that are placed um, you know, upon jurisdictions, if we are able to demonstrate that, that we do comply with, you know, radio frequency emissions. Um, you know, I think we, we worked, uh, David has worked in this jurisdiction for years, uh, successfully uh, has done two other RFPs uh, on an, a Nersnack Hill and uh, Concord Center, uh, and then has been working this area for several uh, years. And, you know, we've, we started with, you know, with the town, you know, to be a, a, you know, a good neighbor and to provide, you know, benefit to the town with regards to uh, revenue. And at the same time, you know, think that it is the, uh, the smartest, if I may, um, installation because it's, a, it's an existing structure, it's in a cupola, and 
it's 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 not invisible, but it's nearly visible, um, you know, with that installation. Um, so, uh, thank you. That's an overview. <laughs> thank you, because uh, I do appreciate the fact that uh, the last meeting, I think there was a lot of concern, and we did ask you to go and to see other alternatives, perhaps, and, and you've done that, and that's appreciated. Uh, does any of the board members have questions or comments they'd like to make? I guess I, have, I appreciate having the PowerPoint. It is easier than Crane and <laughs> our next to see that. Thank you. Um, so my, uh, my question is about an understanding how you define need. I understand when you look at a map, there are obvious gaps when you take a look at it from that perspective. But I wonder if you, if there's, if you take into consideration request for service or uh, uh, calls for intermittent service. It, what do your customers tell you the need is in this area that the map shows is an unmet need? Do they correlate? Do you hear from customers saying, service is terrible, we're gonna drop Verizon? Uh, yeah, perhaps the um, town consultant can answer it better than I can, I'm not an RF engineer, but basically speaking, these maps show signal strength and the engineering department at Verizon Wireless in our competitors are pretty impressive. They have design engineers and performance engineers. So they know um, if, your call, if, your, if you drop a call, they know it was your phone number, where you were, what time, things like that. So it's all anticipated exhaustion of the existing network. So they know, say, three years from now, your phone may work today in your home, but three years from now, the service is going to be degraded uh, consistently because of anticipated increase usage so they basically they design the network on anticipated needs through the engineering of the existing network and they will identify these areas of um, a, where there's going to be a capacity problem and they release these to real estate folks like myself and it takes approximately three years to identify lease and zone and build um, these sites so our customers never experience a degraded coverage or degraded um, service. So what so, you're talking about is you're now planning for a future scenario of increased use that's three to five years out, but you're installing today's technology. So is there something to compensate for what presumably will be a significant change in technology in the next three years when a need may arise, or are we planning with old technology to meet tomorrow's need. I'm just not yeah. quite sure I understand. Yeah, so we're, so we're deploying, um, you know, LTE, long-term evol uh, evolution, the f uh, 4G technology. So m maybe to, to uh, help with what uh, David is saying is that, you know, right now there exists this gap in coverage here um, downtown. And what that means, and I think the, the town's own bylaws say, they give a specific um, 95 dBm, uh, I think, you know, for a, a strength. So I think that's the strength, the signal strength that the town's consultant, you know, put in here. And that would be a strength that would allow Verizon Wireless to provide uh, reliable uh, service. Now, pursuant to the licenses that Verizon has, you know, paid for um, from the FCC, you know, they're required to build out that network and provide that coverage within those, you know, license footprints. So what David is saying is that, you know, we have that uh, gap in coverage here right now. Well, demand is, has grown so much and so exponentially that the footprints to each of these sites that are existing around here now are actually shrinking. And, we're, and they're in there, uh, and David's been doing this for 20 plus years, going in and, you know, they're putting in the, the latest and greatest uh, technology to each of these sites. And for example, I, I spoke of the remote radio heads, and maybe that technology has been in the last five years. And that's bringing, um, you know, technology that used to be in a computer sitting in the equipment shelter. Uh, it's eliminated the need for that giant equipment shelter, and now we're doing equipment cabinets, and it's putting this, uh, again, remote radio head that's the size of a milk jug up behind the antenna that's giving uh, the antenna the ability to propagate uh, you know much more so the answer is yes they're they're doing that constantly we're not able I mean we're fighting against the demand uh, and and gaps more gaps are we 
I've been filling gaps for 20 years for Verizon Wireless, and I kept thinking one of these days there are going to be no more gaps and Earl's going to need to look for another job. But because the, the, the demand and the, and the changes of, of how you know, our devices are being used, all these footprints are shrinking and causing a, a, gap, a more of a gap here and more of a gap there. So, so, so yes, with improving technology and uh, all of us, you know, the, the more we're on our handheld or, or whatever de device we're using the network is, is taxing what exists and we have to build out uh, more. So, I don't so, know if that's uh, clear or... <laughs> Gap is also, it's not only cell phones, it's computer and other uses. It's, well, it's uh, voice and everything. data yeah, and everything. video, everything. Everything, so. Everything, that's correct. Um, th I mean, my concern is that without filling this need, uh, businesses and other usages in the center of town are, um, are gonna be at a disadvantage and uh, we kind of have an obligation, I think, to make sure that uh, there is adequate coverage. That being said, we want to make sure that it's being done in as safe a manner as we possibly can. Right. Well, I think that the, the, the process that the, um, that the town has with regards to the filing for the special permit and site plan review and the requirement that a, uh, that a, a town's consultant is um, retained so that uh, the board has as much education or knowledge as uh, the applicant and their experts. Uh, so it's, it's a, I mean, we, we welcome uh, when jurisdictions get an expert involved because it actually helps us. Because we, if, if we didn't need um, a site here, uh, we, <laughs> we put a, a lot of years and a lot of time, yeah. Yeah. Into this, so. so you you mentioned um, whether it's radio heads or some other technology. You mentioned that there was a, a possibility of expanding that at each of the sites that you went out to look at. Um, was that under discussion when you went to those sites with the individual churches and faith groups? Uh, uh, yes. So with, with the with the churches, uh, Verizon Wireless is not located in either of uh, any of those churches, and. Um, you know, the first, so um, the Holy Family Parish, T-Mobile has their right uh, next door, if I'm looking the right direction. Um, uh, T-Mobile is installed there, so there's not sufficient room up in that cupola for Verizon Wireless to have any antennas. Um, so it rules out that uh, possibility. Okay. Um, same with the uh, Trinitarian Sprint is already there, um, and uh, first Parish, um, because of the, um, it's not a cupola, it's a belfry and there's a bell there, we would not be able to conceal uh, any antennas there. And I think that uh, that's a no out of the gate with, you know, with uh, historic considerations. So maybe I misunderstood your um, earlier comment, but you did say uh, another alternative was to go back to the existing steeples and expand some capability. Uh, um, it, it wasn't with regards to the uh, churches, it was with regards to, and I think that maybe I can get back there now. You mean the existing network, correct? So, yeah, the existing so network equipment is being upgraded with right. all of today's technology as well, but it's still not sufficient yeah. to so, uh, eliminate the gap in, in coverage that, that right. will be anticipated. Right. I guess what I was trying to say is when the, um, the the town's RF consultant looked at this um, this um, coverage map. They looked, or he looked, Ivan looked to each of these sites first because the first question he would have is, is there anything that we could do at any of these sites to increase their coverage footprint uh, so that it would eliminate the need for an additional site? Okay, so. thank you. No, and, uh, thank you. It's a great question. And there might be, or no. there is. No, there's no, no. Um, again, if there, if there was, we would, <laughs> we would want to do that. Any other questions or?
I'm going to do at this point, I know there are people who want to comment, but we do have a couple of public hearings, so what I'm going to ask perhaps if you might be willing to wait around, there might be some feedback, and we'll quickly get to the uh, uh, two public hearings, and then we'll come back to this before we, we move on to the rest of the agenda. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, certainly, thank you. And for those folks standing in the doorway, there are chairs up here if you're Seats trying to available. find a place to sit. Just come on in. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, we now, even though we're running a little late, I want to do the um, 705 public hearing poll petition Comcast of Mass 3 Inc. Install conduit cable from Pole 1 Elm Place to poll 96-1 Elm Street. Uh, I move to open the public hearing. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Hi. Good evening, thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, my name is Greg Franks here on behalf of Comcast in support of our petition uh, to install coaxial cable, um, overhead strand coaxial cable from poll number one on Elm Place to utility pole 96-1 on Elm Street for the benefit of um, the occupant of 976 Barrett's Mill Road. Um, I can tell you that uh, a construction representative from Comcast has had the opportunity to meet with uh, Mr. Cosgrove from the light plant. Uh, I have had an opportunity to see the proposed order. I've reviewed that and um, Comcast is prepared to comply fully with all of the conditions therein. Municipal Light and Public Works have both reviewed this and have okayed it. Yes. Anybody have any questions? No, I don't. I guess I have one, uh, just a geography question. From Elm Street to Barrett's Mill, how do you get there? It's, um, I have a... I, my, my map is, doesn't quite show it. I see where the pole is. I'm not getting across from the pole so you can see it starts here on Elm Place. Yeah. Um, goes around the rotary and um, up here to, on Elm Street where they can access the property on Barrett's okay. Mill Road. Okay. And this is all overlashed wire? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions or concerns? Um, we would public comments. Anybody in the public like to make a comment about this application? Well, then uh, I move to close the public hearing. Second. All those. I guess you are moving to I'll close the hearing. So we can discuss. Close the public hearing. Yes. We, we just close yes. the hearing. We can discuss if we have any other questions about it. Um, Thank so a number of conditions that were suggested, <coughs> and I assume that you've read all the yeah. conditions mm -hmm. and approve them all. Okay. Um, I have no other questions. Do you have any thoughts? Also? Are you ready for a motion? I'm ready for a motion. Okay, I move to grant permission to install overhead coaxial cable to, to be owned by Comcast of Massachusetts 3, Inc as requested in the petition plan, marked aerial cable placement request received May 4th, 2018, and is noted in the order dated June 4th, 2018. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. We now um, are reopening the public hearing on the um, uh, compliance with the um, uh, order of the select board to install a backyard fence uh, and replace a six foot tall stockade fence um, at um, the uh, uh, Hitchcock property, 15 Chase Road. Um, all those who, well, while you're probably still remain swearing in, I'm gonna have you swear, uh, Stand up and raise your right hand if you plan to testify today. Uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. 
But then we'd like to come forward and um, you were here two weeks ago at the last meeting. Um, you were aware that uh, we continued it to see whether there was going to be uh, some sort of a proposal for the fence. Uh, you aware of anything? Uh, I've checked today with uh, Mr. Mara and he hadn't heard as of late this afternoon. Went by the house, tried to talk to the family. Uh, there was nobody, nobody would answer the door. I get sent a couple of texts. Uh, Ms. Sitchcock did text me back about a half an hour after I left the house and uh, she said I could call her husband. I tried the husband's phone that I was provided with on a text message and they'll get no answer. I think we had uh, yeah. requested that uh, any proposal be uh, provided to the um, assistant town manager by uh, Friday so that we would have it in our yes, package sir. and uh, there wasn't anything. No, so. I checked with Mr. Mario. He hadn't gotten anything. I don't think Mr. Whalen had no, see that. Correct. As far as you know, has there been any further uh, <laughs> issues or problems in terms of the dog um, being in violation of any of the other uh, conditions? Not since the last meeting, sir. Okay, thank you. Anybody have any questions? Thank you very much. Would you like to, Mr. Yes, please. James Hitchcock is my son, James Jr. Um, just to begin with, uh, I apologize, but I wasn't aware there was a Friday. I thought it was two weeks from the last meeting, so that's why I had saved my proposal for tonight. Okay. So, but my proposal, uh, I was going to install. Let's see if you might agree with it. Just to give you an idea, I Googled Earth my property and I surrounded the, the house where my fence is and I numbered certain areas of the um, fence. And um, my proposal basically was um, eventually I'm going to replace the entire fence. But um, sections one and two, they are the Worst of the worst, as far as my fence goes, and I was willing to replace those with a six-foot stockade fence myself, no problem. Um, section six. Well, have you made any efforts to do that? Since? Well, not until I had approval from the, the committee okay. here, so I was waiting on your yeah. approval to see what you decided. Um, section six is another adjacent uh, for my neighbors, and um, that's less disastrous, but I was gonna replace that as well at the same time as one and two. I don't see numbers. Can you help us with the numbers? Sorry. Yeah. This is uh, number six. I was going to replace that, so that's less. You know, there are numbers on the line. <laughs> I have the wrong way. Oh, you, uh, you got it. Okay. okay. We can look at this one. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank I you. I apologize. You don't get <laughs> yes, okay. but anyway, section six, I was going to include in that. I was going to replace that as well with one and two. Uh, section uh, three is, uh, where was it? I'm sorry. Section six is adjacent to my neighbors. That's already up. Two. He has a six-foot yeah. stockade fence already erected, so it's a non-issue. It's, it's brand new, and it's connected to my fence, and it, it's, it's A1. Um, You're saying Section 3 requires no additional fence because there's... No, a Section 6, six. I apologize. Six. Yeah, I had it backwards. Section um, 6. Yeah, so I was willing... Uh, one and two, I was going to replace it with a six-foot stockade. Uh, section 3 is this uh, other one I had confused with six, and that's a standing four-foot fence in need of repair, and I was willing to do that myself as well. Um, section four and five, I was hoping to put off till later. It's a five foot fence, structurally sound. The only thing that's missing, I've got a couple of cracked slats and one or two that are missing. And I was willing to repair any loose slats and things like that to, you know, appease the neighbors hopefully until the end of the summer when I could just finish the project. But, but for now, it especially is hard for me because, you know, I, I'm a sea captain, so I'm gone half the month. So for me to do this myself, the whole property, you know, it's going to be Obviously a little tough. You don't have to, to do it yourself if well, somebody else is available. Well, it just would be, or? well, yeah, I have sons, but, you know, they'll help a little bit, but, you know, they, they have a pretty busy schedule also. But, uh, you know, that was my proposal. I was willing to basically replace, you know, half of it, more than half. Uh, I don't know what kind of time limit you think would be reasonable. And then at the end of the summer, you know, we, I could finish off the back end. But just now I figured... Well, if you can get the worst done, I mean, that's it, It's progress, absolutely the but, worst um, is the front, yes. I guess we're talking about how quickly. Can we do that in the next couple of weeks? I'm hoping so, yeah. I was hoping till the end of June. Yeah. Not, just a moment. Not only did we ask you to have this to us by Friday, mm -hmm. 
and you said you would, and your wife said you would, but we told you to put it in writing. So this isn't writing. That's writing, to sir. Us. This is that's, that's diagrams, and I gave it to you in writing. I mean, I don't know what else you want me to do. Give it to us in writing. It's writing. But we haven't gotten that. I don't have it. Yes, sir, but I, I wasn't aware of the Friday. I was never told Friday. And I never told you. You were, you were present. At I may have been, but I just yeah. wasn't but aware. I, I certainly would have that's, been. That's one of the concerns I think that we have is that, um, you know, we, I, I would be much more sympathetic if we'd have had this by April 1st. I understand. It was that. the date that mm -hmm. initially yes. kind of said. Uh, you know, we're now um, into June. Mm -hmm. um, so we're already kind of two months. And um, I think anybody who was present at the February 5th hearing mm -hmm. heard the concern of the neighbors and the uh, feeling that uh, the condition of the situation mm -hmm. was uh, causing distress among most of the neighbors. Um, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm a little concerned that there wasn't kind of the focus of, hey, I want to be a good neighbor. Um, and I had heard at the last meeting, uh, one of your neighbors said she was going to make an effort to see if she could get other people to help. Mm -hmm. And uh, I gathered that there were some words exchanged that um, uh, were inappropriate, frankly. Now, um, you know, I, I think this is progress, but I, I'm, I, I think we have to be very firm that um, you know, if the decision is to um, give you the chance to do this, that it's gonna get done, or that you fully understand that you're kind of tying our hands. Oh, I understand that part. Um, it's just before. I mean, the last time there was finance, as I understood. Yes, that, sir. That's I, not an issue now? Well, it's an issue to have a contractor come in my budget no, right but now. Nobody but I'm going to do it myself. Okay. And so I priced some parts and I found some reasonable. Why didn't your wife answer the door when the officer came today? Why didn't you? She wasn't home and neither were I, was I. So I don't know why I have. Did you or phoned you? Or did my, you I didn't have my phone with me. My phone's out of commission right now. So no one called me. Maybe my wife had a text. I'm not sure. But. Yeah, you know, I, I wasn't home today. So, I mean, I know police officers showing up at my house at unscheduled times. I can't help it, you know, somebody there not to answer the door. You know. Knowing that you had this hearing tonight. Yeah, I had a hearing tonight, but that has nothing to do with somebody showing up at my house. So with this plan, what I see is you are, you are proposing you will replace sections one and two. Yes, ma'am. Tell me again about section three. Uh, yeah, I was going to repair that also. It, it's in less disrepair than the front two sections that, that, that the neighbors can see immediately. But I figured it's about, I forgot the exact measurement of it, but it wouldn't cost me too, too, too much more just to section that off and just get the worst of the worst done. Do we have a quote from the neighbor, Mason? Oh, well, that's, you know, but I don't know if they'll even listen to it right now. But What is the proposal? Well, no, I have a quote. There was a quote by the neighbor that lives by that property, Mason King, on line three, and I can read what he wrote. So it can shows you pull that he's not a yeah. little closer to yourself. A little closer yeah, there. thank you. It can show, I can show it to you guys that he, um, let's see. The neighbor that lives behind property three was not feeling threatened. Um, so it's written on January 27th, and it says, I see the Hitchcock dog often. There is just a small picket fence between my backyards and the Hitchcocks. This dog does not seem to be dangerous in any way. He comes up to the fence and seems friendly. My Mason King, and I have okay. it right here. We don't, well, we've been yeah. all over this in terms of whether the dog poses a hazard or is I think the whole, I mean, the ideal is that the whole fence should be secure. Now, you know, I, I can appreciate that if you get most of it done and it's the only repair work on the others, um, that might be satisfactory. I, I just have a little trouble with the trust issue because um, you don't seem to be making kind of any effort to uh, be in compliance. You're gonna do your own way. And what I'm concerned about is um, that there's gonna be a fence put up, uh, understandably not by professionals, and that it's, um, 
you know, may not be adequate. Um, so we have to kind of trust you that that's, you know, you're going to do a decent job. The other aspect is it's got to get done. Yep. You know, it's not going to be end of June. You know, I, I'd like to see it get done in a week. Uh, so would I. Uh, but well, can you do, I mean, what's practical? That's what we asked you to, that's why we wanted something in writing. Now, you've got some writing information, but if you would check with the assistant town manager, what do they want? What do you think is appropriate? How should I do this? You know, but you, you do it, yeah, I'll do it my own way. And that's kind of seems to have been the approach, the whole issue, I mean, for six years. Um, so that, um, I don't know what fellow board members, I, I'm inclined to give you one more chance, um, just because the uh, alternative seems to me, um, you know, so, so final. Uh, but I, I think you have to understand that uh, it's got to get to, this is number one priority. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that there are a lot of other things going on, but it's got to get done, and it's got to be done in uh, a good professional manner. Uh, I don't know how much experience you have in, in building fences. Do you have any? I've done some. Not a lot, but... And can you get help from somebody who knows? I did some people I could find. Will you? Of course. So I, well, I have yeah. two questions about yeah. the proposal. So I see an immediate replacement of one, two, and three. Have you had conversations with the neighbor on side six? What you described to us was the neighbor has a six foot stockade yes, fence. Mm -hmm. But it's un I'm uncomfortable with you relying on your neighbor's fence to secure your dog. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what you have on your side of the neighbor's fence. Well, it's weird. It's, um, yeah, because my fence on the front, it, it, it abuts his fence. He actually has two fences. He has a smaller um, chain link uh, I don't know the footage, probably four foot that runs the length. And then he also has a bamboo six foot privacy fence that runs the length in front of that on his side. So basically, my back end and front end, just they attach to his fence on both sides of the property right there. So unless I, I would think it would be overkill and then if I put my side another stockade fence, that would be three fences. Just, uh, I mean, but it's attached. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it goes right up but to the property. a little bit of a concern for me yeah. about you know, this is to secure your dog, not yes. for your neighbor to secure his own property from your dog. No, oh, I understand. So that. I just want to make sure that that no, you don't neglect side six mm -hmm. because you're suggesting your neighbor's fence does the job for you. Your job is to secure your yes. uh, your yard so that the dog doesn't, you know, leave your yard to get near your neighbor's <laughs> fence. Mm -hmm. so that may be an extra protection, but it's not your responsibility is how you care for your dog mm -hmm. in your yard. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question maybe as a town manager. What, what would be our means to inspect the quality of work to make sure that the fence being after it's installed, <coughs> how do we know that it's like sturdy? I would think the animal control officer could um, perform that inspection, make sure it's sturdy. I, mean, I feel like I yeah, would want an inspection yeah. afterwards to make yeah. sure, not that I doubt that you can do quality work, but any time that we have work done, we always have an inspection to make sure it's you know, sure. sturdy and it will mm -hmm. secure, in this case, an animal from mm -hmm. escaping. So that yeah. makes me feel better. Yeah. Linda, do you? No, I think that's. I mean, I'd like to see, you know, and I don't know if you've got the capacity, but photographs of the final when you come back, yeah. um, perhaps invoices for the wood that you've you know, purchased or obtained somehow. Um, I mean, we want to be sure. So the last thing we want is to have another problem after that. Well, that's the last and thing sure, I want. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine. But again, uh, you know, I, 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 hate, I just don't quite trust you at this point. So that I would like to see, I mean, I, I'd love to have this put to rest and have the neighbors satisfied and to have you all then be able to go on with your lives. And, um, you know, I, it sounds as if you're handling uh, the dog in a, in a capacity that's not causing problems. No, we've done everything else on the, And that's, you know, a, that's appreciated, so. but the fence is critical. It is, and, I understand. Yeah. It just seems to be at this yeah. point in time, for whatever reason, it landed no, I mean, on a... It kind of, two months after, 
this is, it should have been two months ago that we're having this conversation. So uh, I hope you appreciate the <coughs> sort of skepticism that. Um, That's fine. I understand. <laughs> Mike, how about? Well, I'm. I'm um, going to go along with your proposal. I don't. I'm, I'm not sure it's the right thing to do. We've heard nothing but we're going to do, and we might do, and we could do, and then nothing happens. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not out of patience. Um, if it's a short time frame, two weeks. If we get from uh, tomorrow a written statement of what you are going to do that conforms with what you told us here this evening, and at the end of the period of time, whatever it's going to be, there's an inspection by yeah. the animal control officer and that she testifies in writing that, that she believes that fence will secure the dog on your property and eliminate the threat to the neighbors. Mm -hmm. Anything like that's unclear at this point in your mind? Oh, that's fine then. Okay, so you want a written proposal. Just like we ask you for. Uh, tomorrow, and who do I turn it into? Mr. Morrow. Yeah. The town. town manager's office? Okay, I can do that. Can I, can I just ask the officer uh, if what we're proposing seems reasonable and appropriate, or if we missed anything that he would suggest? I think it does, that, that side that he's talking about where the fence is in place already, I don't think he needs to do anything on that side. There is a six foot stockade fence. There's also a chain link fence that's about three feet in front of him, so I don't even think the dog That's is six in his. I don't, uh, well, it's the one that runs between the two pieces of property. Yeah. This oh, one sorry. here. This is a numbered one. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is the concern five. And this three. Because these are the neighbors that sit across from the seat. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. And that's what causes their anxieties. The dog's jumping on the fence when they see Got it. people coming over with their dog to be guys. Okay. So the concerns are five and four and five, or five and six? Um, no, I think it's four, four and five, you say you, you're going to plan to have a uh, later point yes, in sir. the summer. Mm. But, that, but they're uh, structurally sound. I mean, I went yeah. back there and I... You're going to repair, but... Uh, yeah. Uh, and that should be in the written... Uh, even if she was still, you know, uncomfortable about it. I mean, I, I'd even put in just on her area, like maybe, what are they, those blinds or something on the... Posters, yeah, she can't really see yeah. the dog. I don't know, but structurally, it's it's not going anywhere. So, I'd like to set a date by which the construction of one and two will be complete, or one, two, and three would be complete. And I'm well. Our next meeting is on the 18th. Um, I would suggest that uh, it be done certainly by the 14th which would be the Friday before, so that we can have, you'll have the photographs and uh, whatever and uh, completed, and we can have the inspection perhaps uh, take place um, on that date. So it needs to be done the day before. So, so that's actually the 15th. Um, is that, is that 15th practical? Is, 15th I, I want to do something, I don't want to set up a situation I, I just, I, I, I couldn't swear to you it is. I, I'm hoping, I'll try my best. I, uh, but, uh, I mean, if I mean, I don't even know what the date is exactly. What's it, 4th, 3rd? Today third? is the 4th. 4th, so 10 days. So we're talking, um, okay. the day is Monday. We're talking about a week from Thursday that you have it completed. So it gives you the weekend, it gives you the rest of this week, and then it gives you yeah. three more days to finish it up. It shouldn't be a problem. I'd like another week, but if not, I mean, what am I going to do? Yeah. So. Well... I mean, I hope you appreciate kind of why there's the concern of having it done mm -hmm. quickly because, um, I mean, as I say, I view this as we're already two months behind. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to make sure there seems to have been, each time we've tried to have a communication, there seems to be a little bit of a miscommunication. So if there's any No, I'm just making sure have, now I hear everything correctly. So tomorrow I'll bring in writing to the manager's office and then after that, something on the 14th, you want to have those sections completed. 
Uh, yes. And, and the next meeting is when? Uh, is uh, the, 18th, the 18th, two weeks from today. 18th. All right. All right. Well, thank you at least for the progress that we've made, and hopefully we can uh, complete it. Uh, so I guess we will continue the hearing. Continue the hearing. Move to continue the hearing to uh, June 18th. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, why don't we go back then? Should we do the All rise set. and have the? All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joe. Have a few people go. I, so I would just like before you go to the next. Uh, back to Verizon, which is fine yeah. with me, if you would just, for the record, articulate <coughs> what it is he is to do, when he is to do it. Okay. So we have it formally as part of Mr. the Mr. Hitchcock provided us with a uh, drawing on a photograph of his home. He's indicated that sections one, two, and three will be uh, replaced with six-foot stockade um, and that uh, my understanding is that two, which abuts um, six, will be linked into that fence. Um, that he will further, um, uh, at some later point, which we can probably determine on um, uh, the 18th, uh, will repair. Uh, as necessary uh, items four and five on his list. And I'll hand, I'll give Andrew this uh, document here. Um, he is to tomorrow uh, to come by the office with a written uh, description of the proposal that he is going to do. Uh, that these replacements will be completed um, by a week from Thursday to allow the dog uh, control officer uh, to inspect the property for, uh, to ensure that uh, they've been done properly and securely. And he's also going to provide uh, photographs of the work that he has completed. Uh, is that summarized? It does, well? yes. And I just want to make clear, the reason I wanted in the writing was I want him to acknowledge what it is he's supposed to do because he didn't seem to recall yeah. what he had I'm, said he would do before. Right. So I'd like to. So would it be of, of use for us to authorize the chair to put that in writing and send it to him so he has a copy in writing of what he agreed I'm happy to? happy to, to do that. Yeah. Sure. I mean, then there's, yeah. it's it one be, thing to have it in our record, another thing to have him in, in his mailbox. Yep. I think that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so why don't we go back on the uh, update on the Verizon. I have a hunch that there may be some public comments uh, on that and uh, I don't want to belabor in that uh, we are, um, have a very busy schedule so if anybody who wants to make a comment um, will do so um, and be as succinct as possible. Uh, it would be appreciated. We have received a couple of, of letters uh, expressing um, uh, feeling that um, anything in Emerson Umbrella uh, also uh, poses some uh, difficulties and uh, concerns. But uh, if somebody wants to come up and uh, make the statement, please do. We actually have you come up here, be fine. Just identify yourself and your address. Um, Michelle Scavengelli, 129 Everett Street. And I did send an email to yes. I think all the folks here. So I will just hit the highlights for the Verizon folks and everyone else listening. Um, it really was striking to actually see the picture of what that unipole would look like in Emerson Field. I live across the street and I use the field and I look at it every day and it's, I think as I said in my note to you guys, I think Emerson Field's like one of the treasures of this town. Everybody uses it. Um, little League, track, the schools, there's people there all day long with their dogs. 
and the beyond you know my own concern as a as a close neighbor but that would really disturb the aesthetic of that park um, that huge pole and I'm very concerned um, I'm, I'm sure that Verizon has safety people who are going to say that there is no uh, danger that you're below whatever level but I think the verdict is out on that and we have children in that park all the rec programs are there so I think um, you would err want to err on the side of caution in putting something I, I just I was looking at it today as I was writing to you I can't imagine people milling around a cell tower it just I mean I understand why people wanted to look for another place but I think that would just make me concerned about the look of that park the use of that park people wanting to go there we do picnic in the park in July so I hope the selectmen wouldn't consider that or any of the boards an appropriate place and um, I would also just say that as someone who lives in the center goes back and forth with my kids in the center yeah at different points sometimes you drop a signal but that's kind of true everywhere and I think health and safety of people has to trump the occasional dropped call honestly I just looked on my phone here I have four bars and we're in the center of town so I don't know if this is a Verizon pro I, and I'm a Verizon customer but um, I would just go on record as strongly against um, enacting a structure like that in the park and I only recently found out about this um, a neighbor told me when that you were looking at it I have a feeling if the broader town knew that that was a place people were looking at you you'd hear from a lot more people so thank you thank you for coming thank you anybody else or Chris, while well, somebody else yeah. is coming up can I, yeah. ask, can I ask Chris a quick question the the uh, tower or whatever it was that was going to be put at the Kai's Rose <coughs> facility was that like a monopole as well or yes so it was a monopole not a tower with antennas hanging on. That's correct. It was a flagpole looking mono, like a monopole that the HDC rejected in 2007, I think it was. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Alicia Boyajan, 33 Stowe Street. Um, I just want to say that I am really appreciative of the opportunity to participate in the conversation, and I do feel like our town leaders have been listening, and I'm encouraged by the fact that our voices and concerns were heard over the umbrella siting. Um, I'm thankful that Verizon has not steamrolled ahead with the application process and appears to be very thoughtful and deliberate in this process. Um, the scientific evidence, I believe, does suggest there are potential health risks for living in close proximity to towers. Um, I know Verizon will tell us um, and, the, and the only guidance they do have are the current FCC guidelines, which haven't been updated since 1996. A lot of information has come to light since then, and as we all know, government is very slow at catching up to science. Um, so the goal in these sightings, I think, should be to, to provide as much distance as we reasonably can manage from places where people spend long periods of time, particularly children. Um, residential dwellings are, I think, of the utmost importance to protect because these are the places where young kids sleep for 10 to 12 hours a day. Um, we know that children's developing bodies and brains are more susceptible to all kinds of environmental exposures, including radio frequency, radiation. Um, so we still don't know the exact magnitude of the, the risk, but if even only 1% of my friends and neighbors were negatively affected by the sighting of this tower, that would matter to me, and I know a lot of people in the neighborhood. Um, the Emerson flagpole site is farther from homes and schools than the umbrella. I think we measured the closest to be 140 feet, and the flagpole 
picture shows 400 feet, so I think the proposal is moving in the right direction. But the park is a place, as the other, my neighbor said, a place where we hang out, where our kids go, where we go to move our bodies and um, unplug. And so now we'll be sending our kids to play around the cell tower. Um, we saw during Verizon's last presentation that the DPW yard on Kai's Road would offer good coverage with the least amount of impact on residential areas. And I understand the Historic District Commission denied that site several years ago, in 2007. And I believe they continue to keep that position that it's uh, inappropriate from their point of view with the location, so. So I guess I would like to hear that officially and formally um, from the HDC. I think it's, I think it's, um, reasonable for our select board or whoever has the power to do that to ask the HDC to formally um, review that site again and if it's possible for Verizon to submit a new application for that site if if it's possible to maybe submit two applications I don't know what the process is but I feel like we owe that to the community to make sure that that stone is not left unturned. Thank you. But one more yes. Hello. I'm Patrick Everett, 15 Stone Street. Um, the 1996 FCC guidelines for cell tower emissions were based upon the heating effect, then thought to be the only problem. Later studies have shown much worse can happen. These studies are found in the International Bio Initiative 2012 meeting report, which is on the internet. Even one th they have found in their report that even one thousandth of the SCC guidance may cause damage. Damage can be to a fetus, sperm, DNA, or the brain, etc. It may be a group 2B carcinogen. The damage may take 10 years or more. The FCC guidance was premature because uh, so much has been learned since. Um, the, this concerns me. I live just 300 feet from Emerson Umbrella. Uh, with an RF meter, I measured around, much ex around existing cell towers in Concord Center and Wi-Fi in my home. Levels were typically lower than the FCC guidelines, but sometimes uh, uh, slightly exceeded the bio-initiative safe values, which are way, way down from the FCC guidelines. Levels fluctuated with time and place, but near Bildam and Tricon cell towers were similar to elsewhere. While we presently seem safe, uh, looking at the FCC guidelines, um, mightn't much more powerful equipment be installed, with, which is still within the FCC guidance, and then be difficult to remove when it's recognized as dangerous. Uh, I tell you, the orders of magnitude lower that the uh, bio-initiative uh, report uh, talks about. And people should make themselves, anybody involved should look at that report. It's very convincing. I propose a moratorium on installing cell towers until safety has been worked out and meaningful guidelines developed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you cite that reference one more time, just so I can... Beg your pardon? Can you cite the reference of that report that you're uh, suggesting? I can give you right? my sheet. Thank you. It's on there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And I have a second, if anybody would like a second. I see, sure. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Yes, you have one more. Melissa McBride, uh, 57 Everett Street and 25 Stowe Street. Um, okay, so I'm sort of speaking on the heels of Alicia. Um, having, first of all, appreciating all of you again and everything you're doing, trying to help us out with this. Um, what many of us have talked about in the last five or six months since the last meeting, but not really pursued is the Historic District Commission part. 
I think we heard various people say it was sort of a done deal. It could not be readdressed. So we just sort of were like, okay. And then as this date approached, I just really felt like someone needs to reach out to them. So today I emailed the chair who, for personal reasons, was not able to really converse with me. But um, then I was referred to another member who I spoke with briefly on the phone today. Let's see. So my recollection, and I don't know if he's in the audience, is um, that though their purview is basically the look of things in the historic areas of town, he seemed open and he said, I'm one person on this committee, so, um, you know, on, on this board, so, you know, I, I'm only one person. But basically, um, they would be willing to listen to townspeople visit this again. And, and his, my understanding of his um, description of the process is that we would come to them first as members of the town and um, express our concerns that have all been said here prior to me speaking. Um, and that they would be open to it, even though that is beyond their purview. Even though, you know, I get it. I get everybody's a little concerned about the historic district committee. God bless them, but um, commission. But, um, you know, he seemed very open to it and also, you know, said, and then Verizon would need to reapply as they did before. So I just wanted to add that. Um, I think there's an opening and I think um, like Alicia said, we should certainly um, take that seriously. Thank you. I mean, I appreciate the, um, the cons you know, the, the desire to put it in as safe a place as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think we all want that. I, I think what I appreciate is that you're not saying there can't be any, you know, cell towers because uh, I do think the town needs it for a number of reasons. Uh, so I think your comments, uh, there's no reason why we can't get the historic district. Uh, uh, there, there's been, I think, informal communication, but uh, as you say, that's not adequate for the purpose and uh, we should have that explored more thoroughly. So Great. we'll get that done. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I think we are ready. One no, one. Did you have it? Come on up. Yeah, sure. Uh, good evening, I'm Peter Scavengelli, 129 Everett Street. Um, <clears throat> you made it back safe and sound. <laughs> I did, yeah, it was a long drive. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I think, s I'd like to get on the record first that I'm unequivocally opposed to locating a unipole anywhere in Emerson Field. Um, and for several reasons, I think some folks here know that I'm a a former chair of the Carlisle Board of Selectmen, and I can't help but sort of internalize what's going on on the other side of the table. And I would think that if you sought guidance from the, the ZBA, they should advise you that what's being, you know, to propose a unit you know, tower in Emerson is a violation of the town's um, zoning bylaws um, because the, it's located within a thousand foot barrier. I'm a 300 feet from there. Um, <clears throat> in fact, one of the photographs you saw was a little bit muddy, was taken right from in front of my house, straight down into the, um, where the flagpole is located now. So the ZPA should, should advise you that it's a violation of, of, the, of the bylaws. Um, I think you should consider involving the, the Board of Health, because there are, if you've heard from others, there are health issues. I don't know why the Board of Health is, is not involved. And I, I think the idea of a double negative is not the standard, you know, for, for Verizon or whoever to come, you know, and say there's no scientific evidence that it's not unhealthy. You want, I think the standard should be, you want an express representation from whoever the experts are that it's safe, it's healthy. And I don't think you can get that from anyone anywhere right now. So the Board of Health should oppose this. The Historic Commission, as you heard, has already gone on record to say that locating a unipole in a location that disturbs the view and the peaceful enjoyment of your property is a problem. They, they could not support that. 
and just because we're not, you know, Emerson is, Field is not in the zoning, I mean, is not in the historic commission, doesn't mean that the same standard doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. And so if you get guides from the ZBA that says you cannot or you should not locate a Unipol in Emerson, and the same thing from the Board of Health and the same thing from the Historic Commission, then it feels like the proposal should be summarily dismissed and not advanced beyond this meeting. So those are my thoughts. Well, I'll say I think the state is looking into the, the health thing. Uh, the Board of Health, I'm not sure, really would have the sort of capacity to do so uh, where the state is, uh, is we, doing, as I understand, a fairly thorough <coughs> sort of job on it. But uh, the difficulty is sort of the state of science. So. But thank you for your comment. Well, we got we all we got your your note yeah. today, which yeah. laid out much of what you've just said. A couple of things I'd point out to you: the ZBA would not do what you suggest. They wouldn't undertake guidance without a formal proposal to look at. Number one, and number two, the ZBA can grant waivers to the bylaw. So even if it is within a certain distance of homes. The ZBA has the authority to grant a waiver to that. So the ZBA would certainly not do what you suggest, and that is provide us guidance without a formal process as to what to do. And secondly, as I recall, and Chris, you correct me if I'm wrong here, um, despite the health concerns, which I understand and take seriously, they can't be used as a way to deny a permit. That's the law. So, that's the Federal Telecommunications Act. That's right. Correct. So while I understand your point completely, uh, it's, not, it's not only a problem that the evidence perhaps is not as strong yet or perhaps ever, but it's not as strong today as we would like it to be. Mm. You're ex expressly prohibited from using health concerns to deny a permit. So I think you need to understand you know that we've got to operate within those boundaries and we're trying to find a place that gets us coverage and causes as little disruption as we can to the town so thanks very much for, for that that makes yeah. sense I, I think the folks here that you've heard from tonight they're they're afraid you know frankly they're afraid that. for the health they're af afraid yeah, for the it. property values and and afraid for whatever else is going to be installed in emerson field you know and so what that's else? why we're Something we don't know about? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think we can now uh, move on to the uh, discussion of affordable housing on the Garo mm -hmm. land. Um, How was it? And we had, um, Jane was at, uh, there was a meeting uh, where of the various housing um, principles where I think it was uh, generally uh, agreed that um, uh, one unit um, that the, the family would be willing to um, uh, sell at the price that has been negotiated uh, only with the proviso that it be one, one unit uh, of housing and uh, I think the thinking was that that one unit would be as near Commonwealth Avenue as possible, but there was concern that I think you raised, Mike, at, at a meeting about uh, making sure if we limited or put a, a, a particular uh, line that uh, there might be other reasons that would uh, make the uh, unit impossible to build, and we do want to get the, the one unit. Um, I don't know whether, is there anybody going to be? There's multiple um, parties here from, that would, I think, like to comment on the um, proposal about, for affordable. So are you inviting comments from the public first, or? Um, anybody? Sure. Would the public like anybody or anybody here would like to say? Any on the board member want to make a comment? Uh, any public uh, comment? Good evening. Good evening. Jeff, Jeff Collins, 55 Highland Street, and current chair of the West Concord Advisory Committee. Um, thanks for, for the time. So the West Concord Advisory Committee has talked about this parcel for, for uh, been aware of it for years, and um, identified in the context of many plans this being an ideal parcel for open space and recreation, 
reflected in open space and recreation plan, uh, the long-term uh, comprehensive long-range plan of 2005, and the, uh, or I'm sorry, maybe it was a more recent one, and, and the recent comprehensive long-range plan draft. Uh, the CPC land acquisition plan identifies waterfront and open space adjacent to villages and connected to trails uh, as high priorities. And so this parcel checks all of those boxes. And I think as a community, we, we make these plans uh, to figure out when opportunities arise, how we meet various community needs, uh, given limited, uh, limited resources. And while the West Concord Advisory Committee has uh, worked with affordable housing advocates uh, to find appropriate locations for affordable housing in West Concord, given that's our purview, uh, most recently at the Junction Village site, we feel this site is inappropriate for any housing. It's not an issue of affordable housing here or there, but housing at this site uh, versus its, its highest and best use, we feel, for open space and recreation. We just heard very eloquent community input about the, the impact a monopole would have on Emerson Field. We all love and are used to Emerson Field, and I, I'm sympathetic to that. This is a site that's less familiar to us all, but from what I know of it and, and what I feel it could bring to the community to put a house on the site, uh, certainly in the middle of the site, would, would seriously detract from, from the opportunity that we have. Um, I don't know the slope and wetland setbacks and soil conditions of the, the portion of the land adjacent to Commonwealth Ave. Um, the potential to creatively locate a site there, a house there, um, uh, is something worth exploring. But I think going any distance into the property um, just seriously impacts the values that, that could, be, could be realized there for recreation and open space. Um, so the committee feels uh, that, that any housing should only be near the road. In the email <clears throat> calling attention to this meeting and inviting participation, there was conversation about limitations being potentially put in a purchase and sale agreement. Um, and one bit of the language in this email was there, there may be some consideration of limiting the number of houses at the site. I'm frankly very discouraged that we've gone from a CPC application for open space and recreation where the affordable housing uh, committee member representative was present at early discussions in September of, of this potential acquisition for open space and recreation to a point now where we're potentially talking about limiting the number of houses. We remember that the town meeting amended the Warren article to include housing. Yes, and remember that the town council said simply including that as a potential use is not an affirmative right. requirement to include that use. But, but that's what we're asked to consider because that's what the town approved. Yeah. Right. Um, so that would be uh, our, our thoughts on Good. that. Thank you very so much. So let me make sure I get it. So you wouldn't be opposed to a house if the house was located uh, close to the entrance of that property so that it wouldn't sort of impact the large open space recreational area that would be available. Yeah, I think if we... But <clears throat> multiple housing or a house smack in the middle would be... Is that it? I think that's accurate. I think it would be good to look at specific proposals, of course, but I think that there's some potential there. Got it. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, would you like that will work if I don't know if that works or just come, come sit, up set if you sat as you please. I think I prefer this. Okay. I'm Terry Rothermel, 313 Muscatiquid Road. Does work. Mm -hmm. I am an advocate for uh, affordable housing interests. and an intervener in this situation. I'm sorry that we have intervened in a process that was going on that we did not know about in housing. I'm sorry about the harm that some in favor of open space and recreational needs in the town. 
don't feel good about our intervention. And I'm sorry for the errors that we have intervened. I'm sorry, but. In a meeting a year ago, a hearing for the long range plan, a group of citizens overwhelmingly indicated that they thought the greatest unmet need of Concord was affordable housing. So we have a responsibility to look at every situation. It was a responsibility that we, that we tried to ingrain in town procedures 10 years ago. And the process, once again, didn't work. I would advise that anyone considering the pluses and minuses of this situation has to have seen not only the outside of this house, but walked in the inside. This house has two floors of hardwood floors. It has two new bathrooms. You can't see that from the outside. Thus, it is an asset for the town and not something that should be torn down as was originally assumed. This should not be a tear down as we often in town feel that way about another house going down in our neighborhood. This is a wonderful house for another family to live in. And hopefully moved closer to Commonwealth Avenue where it can be out of as much as possible the boundaries of the plan that was drawn up some time ago. And I urge that the one unit be this house. This house. Why build something new? This is as good as a house that we're going to see for affordable housing. And it deserves saving. Once again, I'm sorry for the interference to the family and to the town boards that have worked hard on this. But we needed to be informed. It was, I'm sorry that we were late informed. Thank you. Um, can I say something? What? Can I say something? Yeah, please. It's never interference when you're speaking about something important to the town and something you care about. Hi there, I'm uh, Kate Hodges, Assistant Town Manager. I just thought that um, I would introduce uh, Nancy Jarreau Sumsky and Lawrence Sumsky, who have come to speak with you today um, about their thoughts and, and perhaps answer questions. Please come forward. Yeah. I'm uh, Nancy Jarreau Sumsky. I'm very familiar with the house. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we're uh, from Amherst, New Hampshire, and it's my husband, Lawrence. Welcome. Hi, everybody. We're coming. So first of all, uh, you know, we're uh, very Make sure the microphone okay. is near. So you don't get it's, um, it, it, you know, the home has been in our family for 67 years. My parents built it. It's been a wonderful place to grow up, have my children there. Our wedding reception was there. And we truly, truly want this to be a park for all. It's been, it's been a place for one group of people and the town of West Concord and Concord and all of the visiting people coming up the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail. It's, it's a beautiful asset and will be for the town. 
Right, and uh, thanks for letting us speak, even though we're not town residents. But uh, we do have an interest in uh, doing this the right way. Uh, just a little background for anybody who doesn't know about this. Uh, Nancy's mom was the last to, to leave us about uh, going on two years now. And uh, the town contacted us with this park idea. We thought, and Nancy's parents thought, it would be a teardown. There'd be a development. There'd be 10 condos there by now, two years later. And uh, the town, to its credit, the town manager, assistant manager, had this idea, and it really was out of the blue. Nancy's mom never mentioned that to us. And uh, we immediately said, yeah, what a great idea. We had to talk about the price. We commissioned an appraiser to find out how much it was worth. And uh, the town did as well. The assessed value a year and a half ago was 2.9. And I think that's a real number a year and a half ago. That's a real number. These are professional appraisals from both sides. Uh, the town talked us into taking less than that, $200,000 less than that, which we're happy to do because we get something in return. We get the park. We get the park with the name rights. Now, with due respect to the gentleman from affordable housing, we would not criticize that for a minute. Affordable housing is a very important thing. We support it 100%. But a house in the middle of a park just doesn't make sense. A house is a house, should be on a street. A park is a park. Now, this house can be moved. To, be, um, to use hyperbole, you wouldn't pick up this house and put it in the middle of Emerson Fields. Okay, because that would ruin Emerson Fields. You wouldn't put it in the middle of Rideout Park. That would ruin Rideout Park. This land, uh, and we have a picture here now. It's not the greatest uh, picture, at least from here. I can't see it, but it's a long and narrow piece of land. It's not a big square piece of land like Emerson Park, for example, where you could put a house in a corner. This is a long and narrow land. Now, back in the day, 70 years ago, Nancy's parents put the house in the optimal spot on the seven acres. That's the optimal spot for the park. The house has to go one way or another. And again, with respect to the gentleman, perhaps we agree, I'm not sure exactly from what he was saying, but if what's wanted is to have the house, the existing house, moved over to up by the Commonwealth Avenue, where shall we sign? That's all we wanted, we're agreeable to that. But we're getting mixed messages from the town. That's what concerns us. Because we understood from the last meeting that um, you, you weren't sure that you agreed with what we had written in the purchase and sale agreement that the house, uh, n the number of housing units has to be limited. You know, we reluctantly agreed to one. We agree with the gentleman from the West Concord Advisory Committee that really there shouldn't be any houses there, but you know, we'll try to be the good sport and say, one, if it's out by the street. You see on the picture there, I think this diagram is better. You see the existing house on Commonwealth Avenue, uh, right before 367, I guess. 365. 365. See how small that lot is? And I don't know the measurements, but I would wager that's a tenth of an acre, you know, something like that. The whole parcel there where, that we're talking about selling is seven acres. That's about a tenth of an acre. We suggested in the uh, proposed agreement that you could put a house for the first half acre up by the avenue. That's about, I would say at least that's three of the same housing units uh, as the one that you see depicted there for the existing house. You can put one house there, okay? It's skinny, it's narrow there. That's not the optimal place for the house, but we already know the optimal place for the house is where the house is right now. We're afraid that if we don't have limiting language, then some other people will come after we're long gone and convince you that it's a nice house and it should stay just where it is. That's what we don't want. And we've had an agreement in principle about that for a year and a half. We want an agreement in writing. Write it up, we'll sign it tonight, okay? Because we're, we're, we're trying to be easy and we're trying to work with the town. We're gonna come back with our grandchildren. We wanna go to the park. We want a park that we're paying $200,000 in real money. We're leaving that money on the table and we're happy to. We don't want one more penny, but we want the park that we're paying for, funding, whatever way you want to put it. We're not wealthy. $200,000 is a lot of money to us. We're happy. It's a wonderful agreement. It's gonna be great for the town. And last thing is 
the affordable housing concept, again, we're all in favor of it. But you know what? That's for lower income people, obviously. Well, guess what? The park is for the lower income people, too. Concord's an affluent community. And I dare say a lot of people in town, uh, when they want to recreate, they don't go to the local swimming hole. They go to their second home on the Cape. You know, what a, what a great country. It's wonderful. But the less, uh, the, the lower income people among us who are going to enjoy that park, they're going to benefit from it. So rather than put two or six, whatever number of units, if we leave it undefined, of, of affordable housing there for that two or six families to enjoy, and they would enjoy it, we think it's a much better idea to have it available to everybody. Low income, high income, everybody, including us, we're going to come by for a visit. So that's what we're thinking. An agreement in principle, uh, agreement in principle is fine, but we need to put it in writing. If you agree, we agree, we'll sign it tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, make sure you understand that the reason we didn't want to move forward with that was because the town had approved a warrant article mm -hmm. that obligated us to consider, in addition to recreation, affordable housing. And it isn't something we can simply do in an executive session. That's something we need to do in public so the public can understand what we thought about, how we've decided the issue, how we want to move forward. So it wasn't an opposition so much to any idea you had. It was our, I think, important need to talk about this in, in open session so that the public could comment on it. Well, we appreciate that. We did see the town meeting. We know you have to consider it. And, you know, I'll consider anything. It's fine. Good. That's we want to be here to make sure do. that the town knows where we're coming from, that if you want to go back to the original agreement with a limitation on the placing of the house and the number of houses, i.e., not more than one, we're ready. I got now, it. after you consider, and you may hear from other people and change, you know, have to decide something else, this is what we agree to. This is what we will agree to. And hopefully we can put we, this in writing. I think we got soon. it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it you coming down from Amherst tonight. Yes. Yeah. It is. It's going to be a wonderful yeah. part. We've seen some preliminary pictures, and it's just going to be. Yeah. yeah. No, it'll be terrific. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate it. Mr. Parker wants to talk. Ah, yes. <clears throat> Charles Phillips, I'm at 65, 65 Fairhaven Road um, with the Concord Housing Foundation. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to, um, and you, you probably are already aware that, that the house right next to that property is uh, owned by the Concord Housing Authority. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a possible solution that, you know, rather than talking about a house versus no house, um, that it would be possible to use that property of the Concord Housing Foundation, sorry, the Concord Housing Authority, to, um, uh, to add another unit of housing onto it, mm -hmm. okay. which would then take a tiny, possibly a tiny sliver of land. So I just want to, you know, make, point this out. It's been discussed before, and I want the public to realize that there is, that is a possibility. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to make a comment? Yes, please, come forward. Which one? Either one. Have <laughs> Rick Eifler, 14 Pleasant Street, West Concord. Um, I, full disclosure, I'm also on the housing. It was just here. Um, <laughs> I'm not speaking on their behalf. We don't have a formal opinion on this as a group. Um, I'm an architect. Worked in Concord for 25 years. Have a pretty good sense of design and planning. I think it's possible, it's premature to say that it's the best solution to bring the house to Commonwealth Avenue. Anybody who's been there knows how narrow it is at the, at the um, point. <laughs> and you're either going to have a driveway into the park or you're going to have a house. You're not going to have both. Uh, if you look at our house, it has a driveway on one side. The house fills the other side. There's no room for another house. Um, I think you have it, I think the concept of pushing it to Commonwealth a Avenue um, isn't going to work. I think, but I think you're ignoring another concept, which is, I don't think anybody's walked the full, well, maybe a few people have walked the full property, um, but looking at the diagram, um, 
I think it's perfectly reasonable to consider the fact that this is a really big parcel and that if you imagine a driveway in and a beautiful park and at some point there's a little sign that says private drive, you know, and don't go beyond here. Take this little guy, put it over there. You've got a house, no one's gonna know it's there. Can be done. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I guess we got quite a few more of them. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Karen Curry. I live at 247 on Lawsbrook Road. I am a member of the West Concord Advisory Committee, and I also own a business in West Concord. So sometimes I do hear things from the public, local public, and uh, so ideas. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I just wanted to say that I agree, you know, affordable housing is great. There's a lot of affordable housing over in West Concord versus Concord Center. And, um, you know, if it can work out and we can have you know, one unit for one family, that's great, but it would be really <clears throat> uh, sad if we lost a property or didn't use, utilize something that could benefit thousands of families versus one, one family. So that's my comment. And Thank hopefully, you. Um, don't lose the property. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Where are we <laughs> This live? Yes. Yes. I think so. Pre 47 Lexington Road uh, on the board of the Concord uh, Housing Foundation. I just want to compliment both the Juros and the town management. I think uh, we could walk out of this meeting with everybody happy. I think, as Terry rather mel indicated, if we can save this one house somewhere on the periphery of the property, we all understand that the central purpose of this is the um, is is the park uh, that's what the Giros want the house has to move I think uh, the uh, planners can figure a place to put it and certainly I think uh, it's consistent with our goal as the housing foundation for the town to proceed with an agreement in which there is a limitation to one unit somewhere on the periphery of the property thank, thank you. you thank you yes, sir please come forward <laughs> Maynard Forbes, 27-3 Concord Green and 106 Commonwealth Avenue. Uh, I've listened to all of the comments this evening. Uh, I agree that uh, affordable housing or housing is a necessary item. Uh, I think that the idea of a park is also a very necessary item. I think when you consider the number of people who will be benefited by uh, the park as opposed to the one family that would be benefited by the house that you have to consider the park. Uh, and I think that the family's discussion this evening uh, should weigh heavy in your decision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks. Much. Anybody else? Or? Well, thank you all. I think it was a very helpful discussion. Anybody here want to make a comment or move along? Um, I just want to acknowledge that I, I first of all, uh, I apologize for being late to the select board meeting tonight, um, but I'm glad I made it for this, uh, this discussion. Um, I came to the select board from the West Concord Advisory Committee and um, knew about the Duro property for a long time. Um, and so it was really exciting to hear this opportunity move forward. Um, and I think that there is goodwill across the board here. Um, I think that there are very few parts of, of Concord that don't support um, affordable housing whenever and wherever it can be placed. And I am a, personally a huge proponent of finding places throughout Concord. Um, there are, we have found a lot of opportunities in West Concord because I think there's been a lot of movement in West Concord. I hope we can find the same opportunities opening up throughout Concord because I think that really balances the vibrancy of Concord. Um, I think that it is, it, it behooves us to carry that balance forward in looking at the Jarreau property um, 
in terms of the numbers of people that we can um, satisfy with it and, and will benefit from it. Um, and uh, being creative with our, our crea being creative about how we handle affordable housing within the property um, or as connected to this, um, this sale. So. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Cool. Well, that kind of is a good segue to um, discussion regarding affordable housing funding committee update. <laughs> Okay, um, sounds like everybody can hear me. Uh, my name is Todd Benjamin, I live on Sudbury Road. I'm the chair of the Affordable Housing Funding Committee. Is this too loud? Is it, no, good? Okay, great. Well, thanks for the time tonight. I know there's a busy schedule, so uh, for, the, for the rest of the evening, so I'll be brief. Uh, first of all, before I get into things, I'd like to introduce the other members of the committee who are here. Ray Andrews is over there, if you can raise your hand, Ray. We have Holly Darzen, who's the secretary of the committee, and Sue Myers over there as well. So this is certainly a team effort, so I'm sure there will be some questions after, some comments, so, uh, so please feel free to direct them to all of us and we'll help each other out. So I've got about uh, 24 slides here, probably about two minutes a slide, so, you know, about 25 minutes. Just want to make sure you're awake. I will not touch upon every slide. I'll just hit a couple salient points on a few slides just to keep things moving forward. One of the things uh, tonight, our focus is, A, to update everybody, especially the select board, and also to get some feedback, some comments, some thoughts as to how we can move forward and really make this a, a, a process that works for everyone. And it's so great to hear that there are so many affordable housing people here who are supportive. So hopefully we get some really good ideas. So having said that, I want to make sure that, um, oh, and by the way, let me point out our email address here. Any comments, thoughts, ideas, please utilize this email address. It goes to the board. We'd be happy to get back to you as soon as we can. So um, first of all, I want to reiterate what our meeting, um, what our charge is. So here you see a brief uh, synopsis of what our charge is, to study and determine cost-effective means to support uh, Concord's affordable housing goals. So this is a brief thing of our committee. So we've looked at all of these options you see here. We're only gonna focus our conversation on these five, and we'll just touch upon those briefly as I mentioned. So some of the assumptions that we made uh, when we looked at this, one of the main ones that I'll point out here is in the middle. Uh, according to the planning department, the number of new homes or affordable homes that we'll need annually is nine to 10 new homes per year. And that is based on staying above the 10% sustainable housing inventory. That's the number, the SHI number that some of you may be aware of, that's the 40B number. Uh, some folks, you know, if, you're, if your community is above that 10%, then they are not as susceptible to 40B or not susceptible to 40B uh, developments as a community who is under that. So that's why we're utilizing that number there. Um, the, ne the first thing that we looked at was a building permit fee surcharge. So this is a fee, oops, sorry about that. This is a fee based on $1,000 of construction value in accordance with the town's existing building permit fee structure. And this would be set on a, a sliding scale. Here's a representation of what that scale would look like. And again, I won't, go, I won't do a deep dive into everything. I'm happy to, to share these slides with anybody who wants them. But in the interest of time, I do want to move forward and get your, your comments and your opinions. Um, one of the things that, uh, about this is that the new revenues from this strategy would be in the, in the range of about a million dollars per year based on 2016 levels. The next item that we looked at is free cash. So one thing that I'll point out here is that it's town policy to main, maintain free cash at a level between 5 and 10% of the general budget. Over the last five years, free cash has averaged about 12%. 
So what, do, what does that mean? What is our proposal here? So one of the things that we're looking at is, well, how do we amend the town's financial policies to change that range of free cash? Instead of 5 to 10%, what if we do 5 to 8%? And so in so doing, um, this, would, uh, this would still keep us in line with our credit rating. So this is what Moody's, just over a year ago, Moody's is a credit rating agency. They rate bonds. They rate other things. And they issued a report on the 31st of 2017, credit opinion, reaffirming Concord's AAA rating, which is the best rating a municipal entity can get or, or a non-municipal. And they also gave us an outlook of stable. And part of the reason they did this is this last sentence right here, is the maintenance of free cash of at least 5% of the town budget. So by, you, by changing the town uh, financial policy to go from 5 to 8%, we're still well within that range that Moody's and others look at. So the second part of that proposal would be then we could utilize the, the area of funds between 8 to 10% of free cash that could be allocated to, free, uh, to affordable housing. So in an instance like this, what does that look like? So let's look like this. And this is something that Brookline does uh, for their affordable housing trust fund. They have 15% of remaining free cash appropriated to the affordable housing trust fund. That enables Brookline to maintain a minimum of $5 million in their affordable housing trust fund. So this is kind of the idea that we're looking at here. What would that mean, uh, utilizing Concord's numbers? Well, in 2017, Concord had free cash of 11% of the general budget, which equaled $10.8 million. If we looked at 8% of that, or sorry, 3% of that, which would go to affordable housing, that would be $2.9 million. The remainder of that, the 8%, would be $7.9 million, which would be in the free cash area. So, um, so that's a little synopsis, and I know I'm going fast, but I want to get to your questions and your thoughts, so bear with me here. Uh, the next thing is pilot, which is payment in lieu of taxes. Um, as most of us probably know, Concord um, gets 86% of its budget from uh, residential property taxes. Uh, one of the things that some of us, oops, sorry, some of us may not know is that six of the largest entities that do not pay taxes control over 1,000 acres of land in town with a total property value of approximately $228 million. Uh, the other thing that, that um, occurs for tax exempt properties is that any property they acquire also comes off the tax rolls. So what does that mean for, for, for kind of a revenue stream for affordable housing? Well, if those entities, if only those six entities paid just 50% of the tax owed, that would yield $1.6 million per year for affordable housing. And again, that's not the full boat tax, that's just 50% of the tax. Um, this is an example of some communities uh, near us that do have pilot agreements. Uh, Conc or Massachusetts is one of the states that is very proactive in, in pilot agreements. There are some communities uh, throughout the state that have uh, formalized policies. Uh, Northampton is one. In other entities, the communities negotiate on a one-off basis. So here are some here. One thing that I think is, uh, is interesting is the Concord Housing Authority pays pilot. So we have entities that are, are, are massive entities in town that are exempt, but yet the Concord Housing Authority pays pilot. Also, the Concord Municipal Light Plant pays pilot as well. And if I, I believe that's a, sta a state mandated uh, function of the CMLP, if I, if I recall correctly. So um, I guess the last thing on this is that the idea of looking at pilot here is that it addresses the consumption of land by tax exempt entities. And that's really what affordable housing is, is really kind of about. Why, why do we have such a challenge in having affordable housing in town? Well, there's several things, but one of the things is the, is the extraordinarily high cost of land and housing. So that's why we're looking at pilot and trying to to kind of rebalance that a little bit. And one of the other things here is that affordable housing um, in Concord would not just benefit all of the citizens in Concord, but it conceivably would also benefit these entities in terms of potentially housing their employees. So there's a benefit to the entities as well. And again, this just shows uh, the six uh, tax exempt entities that I referred to earlier. Uh, this is the 50% implied tax here that totals out to $1.6 million uh, annually. The next thing is the real estate transfer fee. And uh, this is something that's uh, in place in 35 states, and this is something that would come into play when a property changes ownership. So one of the things that is interesting, when you look at Massachusetts here, in relation to our abutting towns, our abutting states rather, Massachusetts transfer fee is 0.456%. And as you can see, it's one of the, it's the lowest uh, on this, uh, of, our, of our neighbors. I don't, know, uh, I don't know about Maine. Maine's not up there, so I can't speak to Maine. So what does this mean? Well, if we look at a 1% local transfer fee, and we use the 2017 number, that is $3.3 million in, uh, in revenue that would go to four affordable homes in our community. Right. The, uh, bless you. 
the, uh, one of the other items that, uh, as we started to reach out to folks in, in town, one of the things that kept coming up is, well, what about a town budget line item? Well, and this is something that we're, that we're looking at here, and uh, this is something that uh, the, the town would allocate funds each year through a line item annual budget, and that would allow some predictable funding for affordable housing. Um, so one of the things that, um, and, and actually I should, let me just go back here. If, uh, before we move on to the next slide, if we look at the strategies that we just outlined there, we had about $1 million from the building uh, fee surcharge. Um, free cash is a variable kind of uh, number, so I did not include it in, this, in my comments right now. Pilot payment in lieu of taxes would be about $1.6 million, and the real estate transfer fee would be about $3.3 million. So in total, that's about $5.9 million that would flow for affordable homes. That results in probably about six homes, and, and we base that number at about $600,000 per home. So of course, if you get, if you get a home that's in the average is 500,000, well, you get a little bit more. But when uh, we heard, uh, I think uh, earlier that, um, that a home, a starter home is 600,000 in town, so that seems to be uh, a number that, um, that seems to have some legitimacy and, and relevance to our conversation. Um, so this, these last slides here are just some conversations about, well, where does the money go? Who oversees it? That's not the focus of our charge, but of course we need to speak to that. And so one of the things that we're looking at here is, is uh, how to do that. Um, so one of the ideas, uh, some of these strategies, as you may, as you can probably tell, would require town approval. They may require state approval. So one of the things that we're contemplating is, well, what is the viability or the optionality of having a town issue a bond that would be utilized for affordable housing? The purpose of this would be that the bond funds would be utilized immediately while the affordable housing revenues are accumulating. And the idea would be that those affordable housing revenue streams that I highlighted earlier would pay off the bond. So that would be one way to get things going. But where does the money reside? Well, one area could be a stabilization fund. Uh, another area could be an affordable housing trust fund, like other towns uh, like Brookline and other places in the Commonwealth uh, employ. So I know I talked fast. I hope I didn't lose any of you. Um, one last thing here. Oh, and. Uh, this is just a, a slide that shows some of the approvals that we think we may need to do some of these strategies. Uh, we may be a little off on that, but hopefully, um, hopefully we're not too far off because we want to get going on this. So uh, again, here's the committee members. Here is our address here. I encourage everybody to write that down with a pen and paper or just type it right into your phone. Send us an email, send us your thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. So with that. <laughs> you meet every two weeks? Uh, we, we did uh, initially start to meet every two weeks, but now the wheels are turning. We met last week. We're meeting this week. Uh, our meetings, uh, we're under the open meeting law. The citizens, because you provided an enormous amount of information, and I hope people will uh, attend the meetings and, and stay involved, because uh, there are a lot of options, and uh, the amount of input is, it would be very helpful to get uh, everybody's uh, perspective and at some point you'll have a public hearing that's right so uh, what we did and before we on that topic before I forget there is the opportunity for those of you who would like to join us to to come and join us fill out a green card the affordable housing funding committee we, we'd love to have you at our meetings but uh, but yes the the point is to, to your point uh, mr. chairman is that we will be having a, a public uh, public hearing after we get through some of these uh, some of these conversations we've met with the finance committee we've met with yourself we met with the planning board so we've had a lot of meetings a lot of dialogues with organizations in town. Uh, League of Women Voters is on our, is on our uh, you know, you'll, you'll be next. We haven't forgotten about I just wonder if, if there's a way, <laughs> Todd, that you could make this, this, those slides available uh, so that we sure. can study them a little bit more closely. Sure, of course. Yeah, I know that was a world one tour. Uh, but, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, someplace so that the, well, so also, that the public would have ready They'll access. They'll be on your select board now. website. They're online right now. On, on the which, select board's website. On the select board website. includes these slides. Great, great. I, I just want to say I, yeah. I really appreciate the amount of thought and consideration that went into providing these many options for the town to consider. You know, going into this, this was a very, it was an open slate. And I think you've done, your committee has done, and yeoman's work in identifying opportunities, mm -hmm. um, identifying the costs and the benefits associated with each. So well, thanks. I think it, it's really shown that I was incredibly impressed with the amount of work that you've produced in this slideshow. Right. Well, and, and now the, you know, the next step is really what we really need is feedback from the select board, feedback from the community as to you know, thoughts, ideas. Uh, we we uh, presented to the FinCom last week, got some really great feedback from them and, start, and implemented that. And, uh, and actually at our meeting um, last week, we had uh, a member of, of the town join us and he presented us with some ideas that we hadn't really thought about. And so now we're starting to look at that. So um, you know, this is a work in process and we hope 
uh, real goal is by maybe late summer, early fall, to really kind of have it nailed down and say, okay, after listening to everybody's feedback and taking into account all these considerations, this is what we, we really feel as a committee that, uh, that we're going to kind of hang our hat on. And you'll so. come make that report to the select board when you're completed. I can have a couple questions. Sure. But, um, is it likely, maybe you don't know, is it likely that you'll come forward with, or your committee will come forward with a, um, a plan that has multiple elements? I mean, you gave us a number of approaches. Is it likely that you're going to say we should do whatever, but not one? Yes, I, I, I don't think there's any one yeah, element that can I possibly get us there. I just to make there. that point. Yeah, no, thank you. That's, and that's I think while the town budget I, line item is, um, I, I understand it, but it's going to have ex almost the exact same effect as the free cash right. gig, so I'm not sure that they're really differentiated in practice. I mean, town budget goes up by a million bucks, free cash is coming down by a million bucks. So, <laughs> right, right. Uh, no, I, I agree. Some, some folks, uh, I, I think, uh, I guess it, I, I, your point is well taken. I think it's really uh, perhaps uh, for those folks who don't like the free cash option, then maybe the, yeah. it's, yeah, and, the same. Uh, so. When we got started with the Charles proposal early on was uh, uh, a fee associated with certain size housing as opposed to just a building permit adjustment so is that still in the thinking or is that in, put aside in favor of a general building permit Right. As, so as our thinking evolved around that issue, uh, it really seemed to, to be along that first option that I, that I uh, shared with everybody, the building permit fee surcharge. Um, and so it seemed that, um, that listening to the conversations, leaning, listening to the feedback from last year's town meeting, not the one, not in 2017, the one before that, um, that uh, perhaps um, we could better address Charles Phillips' idea in a way that uh, that would be a little bit easier to understand in that mech. In that Might mech. it be graduated by size? Right, so... Is that, um, is that the way it would play itself out? I think I messed this up, sorry, Andrew. Well, you don't need to show me, you can just, I mean, would it be a size-based? It would be more on contract value. It would be more so on the, contract To me, the... Um, important differentiator between some of the proposals that you put forward uh, is that the, the building permit or the one Charles had proposed uh, last year, that principle, I'm making it up of course, but that principle <laughs> is um, those folks building houses yeah. are the ones that require us to increase our uh, number of affordable units and so therefore that's where the burden of pay should reside. The other proposals are more no affordable housing is a important principle for the town of Concord and hence the burden for this should be spread right. across the entire town. So I, there's funding mechanisms as you're well indicated but there's also an underlying view about affordable housing. So I'm hoping you, when you come forward with whatever your folks come forward with, that is the, that you help us resolve that particular difference in view as whose responsibility for funding it would be. Yeah, and, and you know, I think that's a great point, and that's one thing that we tried to do in looking at, at all of these options, but especially the five that you see highlighted at the top of this slide, is really looking at, um, at making sure that one group of, of people were not, uh, were not singled out or disproportionately affected. We really strove to make sure that the, that the community feeling around this initiative was, was shared by the community. So that's why we do have something with uh, the, the pilot, why we do have something with the building, uh, sur with the building fee uh, surcharge for people who are doing construction for those who are selling their homes. Yeah, thank you. And one thing I, I would mention that um, is not a funding mechanism, but it has to be stated whenever affordable housing is mentioned is the need for zoning. Uh, zoning is a massive <laughs> component. And that's not just here in Concord. It's not just in Massachusetts. That is across the country. Um, other communities are across the country who have uh, challenges like we do with affordable housing, zoning is one of the major ways that, uh, that this uh, challenge of affordable housing can, can, be, uh, can be lessened. So. And the last question, I'll let you get off stage, but a real estate transfer fee surcharge, 
Would that require us going to the uh, general court and uh, that our understanding is yes, asking that, for permission? Yeah, that it would uh, perhaps be a home rule yeah. um, for, uh, and it would have to go to the state legislature. That, that's our understanding. Yeah. Thank you. Anything? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good work. Well, thanks for having us. And again, please uh, give us your thoughts, your feedback, your comments, because uh, really we can't get to where we all want to be without that feedback from the select board and from everybody else. So we really, we really look forward to hearing your thoughts. Great. Uh, we have a question. Um, Todd, I wonder if you could just um, address, you've made a, I mean, this fantastic presentation. Um, but you've suggested that there are zoning laws, uh, that right. some changes in the zoning. Could you be, could you give us at least one example of a, a zoning change that would facilitate affordable housing? Sure. Um, well, you know, I think there's inclusionary zoning, which is one thing that, that we already do. There's uh, accessory dwelling units, which is something that has been uh, discussed in terms of allowing accessory dwelling, dwelling units. I believe, and in, in, I'm sure some folks in the audience and, or on the select board can correct me, but I think the town uh, st uh, law is something about 1929. Is that, is that, am I off base there? I remember something about 1929, if it was a, a accessory dwelling unit that was, no? All right, I'll stop with the 1929 thing. But accessory dwelling units is one thing. Yeah. Another, this looks like the expert. Oh, all right, I knew. See, I knew if I said something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, and then there's uh, there's also the the concept of density. You know, is really um, when you look at uh, at communities that have two eight uh, two acre uh, minimum lot sizes or an acre minimum lot sizes. That that's really a, a big thing. So how how is it that we can perhaps uh, maintain the character of our town, the things that we love about our town, but encourage. Um, encourage homes that are a higher density that are higher density um, and that could be a, t a townhouse that could be um, it could be something like condos or something along those lines um, and also you know how do we look at things like um, like residential over retail that could be another uh, another thing that could help so those are a couple of ideas and I think actually the one last thing I would mention is is I would really encourage everybody to think about the usage of, of real estate. Is there a way that we can perhaps, if we have uh, a, a parcel of land over here that is being utilized for, for one function, is, it, is there a way that we can perhaps repurpose that land and move that, that function over to someplace else? You know, um, so I think, that's, I think it's looking at how we can think about real estate and the zoning in, in, in new ways so that we can still um, meet the affordable homes for, for citizens, for residents. So. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, Marsha Rasmussen, Director of Planning and Land Management, um, we already have two sections of the zoning bylaw that address additional dwelling units. One is for um, structures that existed prior to the adoption of zoning, or, or 1928, but additional dwelling units can be constructed within individual homes. Um, if they've been in existence for at least two years. So a property owner can come in and seek a special permit for that. Um, so Todd is right, zoning does need to be adjusted to make affordable housing more likely to happen and he's outlined several good ideas. Thank you. Thank you. We're ready now um, for Blackbird 2, the discussion uh, age restriction. Hi, I am. Oh. <laughs> it works. Yeah, it does work. Great. Hi, I'm Liz Russ from the Regional Housing Services Office, and at 201 Commonwealth Avenue, and I'm here with Marcia. Um, so we're here to talk about um, Black Birch Two, and the age restriction and SHI subsidized housing unit. Uh, Accessible housing inventory aspect of that project. Um, I think you have a memo in your file, and that's available on the town website as well. So, um, by way of background, so Black Birch Two was um, authorized in, in its uh, zoning um, through town meeting, and then that followed on with a special permit back in 2017. And that project required, it was a 16 unit development overall with two deed restricted units affordable to, how, to households under 80% of AMI. Um, and while not specifically stated in the permit, the town meeting materials indicated that the units would be eligible for the inventory, uh, the town inventory or the state inventory. So the permit and town meeting further required that all the units be age restricted for age 55 or older 
and the permit required a restriction regarding occupants and guests under the age of 18 years old. Um, and that was codified in the condominium documents and part of all the presentations and the project concept from the beginning. I don't think that's of any surprise to anyone. And under the agreement with the, uh, the permit, the Back Birch 2 proceeded to construct and to you know, go forward with the project. Uh, and then just recently in February of 2018, DHCD, the Department of Housing and Community Development, um, issued a clarification on their LIP policy, that's the Local Initiative Program, and that's the program that you use to restrict the units and get them on the inventory. So they issued a clarification, some might consider it a new policy, but they call it a clarification, um, indicating that the agency would no longer approve or would not approve affordable units under the LIP program if children are prohibited from residing in the units. And that was not clear before. That was not clear before, and it was new information to many people. Why wasn't it clear? It didn't say. There were no guidelines to that, that effect. That's pretty clear. <laughs> um, they, um, what they've said is that they've never intended to approve projects that prohibited children. Um, so they have approved projects that have prohibited ch children um, in you know nearby abutting communities. They've done that for some projects that I've been involved with, and mm -hmm. um, in West End and others. And so um, it's their say? clarification of policy. I don't know what else to say. Right. Um, mm. So nope. yeah. So. Um, <laughs> So that they say that they're now, um, you know, they're going to in, uh, review the materials very carefully to inspect them and to see. I know of two projects in this situation. One was granted a waiver and one was denied. Um, the one that was denied was in Framingham where even the, um, the, city, uh, the city bylaw ex uh, prohibited the children in the city bylaw, which was approved by the... The, uh, the, attorney General's the Attorney General's Office, thank you. Um, and, you know, the whole city, and, and they said no. What was approved? Um, so. What, what, what waiver was granted? Oh, in Stowe. 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 And they, it was a multi-phase project where some of the earlier phases had the affordable units approved, and these were subsequent phases. So, so it was far. grandfathered because of the continuum? Right, okay. right. So I think, given that situation, what, what um, I should have started off with, what, uh, what we're here today to talk about is to get uh, to apply to DHCD for a waiver as kind of the first step. Um, they've said that in lieu of uh, p putting together the whole application, which is really quite substantial, uh, you, the town could send a letter describing the project, requesting the waiver, and that they would, you know, issue an opinion on that. Do we know how long that process takes? I think it, they would do it very quickly. Very quickly. Yeah. I'm sure they would. And uh, there's no disadvantage in seeking the waiver. No, and as we've talked through, we've talked with Chris and with Marsha um, and the developer too, um, of, uh, you know, until they say we're, we're going to deny the waiver or grant the waiver, really it's hard to proceed down to what the next steps might be. There are a few you know, paths after that that the board could consider. Somebody's not taking him to court and challenging that? I mean, it just seems mm. not, <laughs> I'm not suggesting. <laughs> just, no, let's not let volunteer. Me, let me clarify. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, uh, I don't know how many other projects are are I in that situation. A condition I, on it to set anything that had already been in play. Or? Well, I know in Framingham is a very large project, um, and it's a big, big developer, and there was a substantial number of affordable units, and they're in, in discussion with the city about um, a buyout option mm. um, to relieve them of the responsibility. So you know, so that there's so other the developer ways. essentially would provide. Some funds is yes, that it to yes. the town, and the town would agree. Right, and then they would no get all. No longer had to do that. Right, and then they would have all market rate units. Mm -hmm. So different, yeah. different kinds of strategies. So we're we're 
functionally in a um, no man's land right now. Right, we don't know. Um, so the, the idea is to, uh, to uh, approach DHCD for the waiver um, and if they deny the waiver request, then to come back and explore alternatives. And just the alternatives might be a buyout option, should something like that be arranged, uh, would be to also, another option would be to provide uh, the units not counting on the subsidized housing inventory, but still restrict them to the 80% low income, more of a local restriction. So and we can do that, but but they would not count. They, they would not count, have, but you but you'd still have still the have affordable units. Still have affordable units, um, and then the third option would be to require uh, that the development allow children in the affordable units, which may or may not be practical. I I don't know. Well, All of those options are, are seems, difficult. That seems unfair. Uh, I. I Yep. Yes, I'm not. I'm not proposing or recommending yep. any. I'm just laying out that these are the So the are first the step for us would be to to authorize the chair to, on on our behalf, mm -hmm. to or the town. I don't yeah. know who. Does well, I, I thought it was Chris to authorize letter. Chris to sign a letter. I've drafted something that we've reviewed, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that's really up to your pleasure. How how you want to handle it. Well, we could get the letter out very quickly, <laughs> and then I think that they would turn it around within a week or two. Oh, okay. I think so. Yeah. Can, can I ask how similar this situation is to the one you mentioned that got a, received a waiver in Weston, where there was a multi-stage Stone. development? Stone. Oh, Stone. Oh. Multi-stage development. Is this similar in that way? This is a there's Blackbird. Um, it's Black similar Black. in that it's a 55-plus project that has condominium documents that have already gone forward that, that prohibit children. So similar in that way, but not similar in, in yeah, any well, other way. It, I think you meant that there was Black Birch A, and now right, this Black is Black Birch. One, Bra Black, Black Birch Black Birch two. One and two. Oh, I don't think you know, so. I don't, you know, because this really counts as a separate project because it's a separate permit. DHCD will look at it as one project if it's one permit. Right. And then the different phasing would be construction phase under a, a, a single permit. Stowe was permitted all at once. All at once, but yes. That required construction phase. over years. Right. And then the Black Birch one also didn't have um, SHI or lower income units. They're all moderate income units. Yeah. Okay. okay. Liz, hasn't the state represented to you that they're highly unlikely to grant the waiver? So we're, we're, we're going to give it a shot, but right. it's, yeah. it's not likely to succeed. That's why, oh, we'll hear, okay. well, that's why we'll hear back from them pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yes. that was my question about how similar we were to some other projects. But it would still seem to me that it makes sense to uh, to seek the waiver. Mm -hmm. and to, and, and it's not going to hurt us. So I think my, what might happen is to uh, you know petition to DHCD, get the response, and then come back to the board with with that response, and then uh, some detail about some of the options, options and go through. Are. Uh, what the procedures might be to to go forward with those options. I mean, and you know, because it was town meeting and the special permit and, yeah, you no, know, some it. unwinding that might have to be done. Mm -hmm. Is there any advantage of also enlisting the support of our elected officials, the state representative and state senator? Or is, oh. uh, I think that always helps, right? I, I hadn't <laughs> thought of that. Like, yeah, just, especially, you know. especially Mike. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Good idea. Can I ask? Do you a, have a, a motion or do we have, have a any question. other questions? I guess first. I have a question before. Yeah. I just want to. Uh, all I need is a head nod that the developer would support uh, this. Uh, uh, us writing on behalf. Is that? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Ready for motion? Ready for motion. So I move to authorize the town manager to request a waiver from DHCD from the prohibition of children in the Black Birch 2 development. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now we have the review and likely approval of the Regional Housing Society in our Municipal Agreement Amendment. Yes. Next pad of papers. <laughs> exactly. Where are they? <laughs> I 
carefully pull them up here. So, um, yes, hi, I'm Liz Russ with Marsha still. <laughs> and uh, I put a little presentation together. Um, so, um, So we're here to, as part of the annual IMA amendment. IMA is the intermunicipal agreement. Do I do I control this? <laughs> How do I go forward? Okay. So um, first, this is a big thank you to all the retiring managers. You might think it's only Chris that's retiring, but essentially the entire RHSO oh. <laughs> town management staff is retiring this year. So it's really every town except for Sudbury. There were eight towns in the RHSO, and seven town managers are retiring this year. So um, that that is not competition. Good news. <laughs> well, I hope I'm still standing at the end. You know? <laughs> um, so I, I I don't know what that means really. I you know transition and with change comes transitions, and and um, I'm sure that there'll be some some new approaches. I guess. Um, so a little year in review, some plans, and then a little bit of the budget, but. Oh, do I? There yeah, we there go. go. Okay, so there we go. So here's our service model. I think that this is probably a repeat, um, but just to show, we, we've added the Wayland Town Seal, so that's our big change for this year. <laughs> and, uh, nice job. And uh, so uh, it's a pretty stable model. I think we're we're in the uh, established in 2011, and we've moved officially, formally, and and over to Knox Trail, and our. The little, Knox Tail trivia is that our USPS, like the, the mail carrier address is actually in Concord, but if you were going to UPS us something, you have to send it to Acton. So we have these two addresses, and depending on how you're going to mail us things, it would go to a different town. You can only imagine that we really use the Kai's Road really address still, because it's too confusing for our clients as well as us, right? Um, but actually, the, the move's gone very well, I joke, no, you know, joking aside. Um, we have some nice permanent space there, and I don't know if it's permanent, but stable space, and we've talked about and agreed that we would stay there um, indefinitely. So where there had always been some discussion of us moving every three years, I think we're, we're, we're pretty well set there. Um, so Chris uh, graciously offered that, the other town managers agreed, <laughs> and we've, you'll see we've included um, an increase in the administrative fees that Concord will take this year to, uh, to make sure that there's no financial downside to that. In fact, probably a little upside. <clears throat> so this is just what we do, right? We, we monitor the ownership units, the rental units. We do program support on the home program. This year we did the Peter Buckley um, we do the inventory monitoring, and that includes things like the black birch and this inventory that we talked about here. Um, for our overall RHSO program, we did a nice uh, infographics that's on our website that has some, some pictures and um, ways of presenting affordable housing needs in Concord. And local board support. This year we've spent a lot of time with the Concord Housing Development Corporation mm -hmm. um, in helping with the open meeting compliance and, and the new direction for them. And I think it's worked out well for them. So very quickly, things I could fit on a slide, things that we've done. We've uh, convened a couple of housing roundtables uh, with the different housing groups. Uh, we've met twice. And that's worked out well, so before and after town meeting to, to get everyone together. Uh, as I mentioned, the, how, the infographic and the Peter Buckley, the home support. I think I pretty much mentioned all of this, right? Uh, working with the rental pro uh, property managers. We work with all the owners doing resales and refinancing and did some work on Emerson Annex in those units. So our plans are continue to do what we're doing and transition to new town management, stay in Knox Trail, get the IMA signed, and continue on, pretty much. Uh, here's, our, here's our budget. Too many numbers. We don't need to go through that, really. It's too late. <laughs> and uh, really just uh, wanted to say that it's successful completing seven years. Chris has always shown such leadership in the RHSO, and we're very supportive of that, as well as you. It's a, it's a program that's really been directed by the town management um, executives, and uh, 
that I think that makes a huge difference. And part of coming every year to have you sign the IMA is just to make sure that it's a proactive step for every town that's involved. So that every year, every select person is, is signing and saying, yes, we want to continue in the program. And so it's our way of just uh, checking in and seeing if you have any ideas, suggestions, or comments for us. And we're happy to continue the support. Great. You do great work, so it's appreciated. <laughs> any questions? I just have one question. Um, on one of the initial slides where you show the um, different contract amounts that the various towns are paying, uh, Sudbury's is, seems to be higher for the size of their town. Are you providing, could, could you explain why? Sure. It's, I'm just curious. Yeah. yeah. Um, so for Sudbury, we do uh, lottery agent work for Sudbury. So the uh, lottery agent or resident assistance or resident selection, um, we do that through the Sudbury Housing Trust because that's the contractual entity. Uh, Sudbury Housing Trust gets a, has special insurance for that purpose, and it's, so it's, that's the contractual entity. So they buy those hours, and they receive in that revenue. So for example, I think everyone got something about Brookside Square with that, so that work is being done through the Sudbury Housing Trust. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay. It's confusing, I know. For motions. Okay. Um, motion to approve the amended Regional Housing Services Office Intermunicipal Agreement as drafted. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thanks, Liz. And, and it's a it's a sign. You you all sign it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Yep. Thank you. Marcia, you're now still. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> still awake. <laughs> Good evening, Marcia Rasmussen, Director of Planning and Land Management, and I see that we have update on planning matters, and I <laughs> yes. have two items. Um, one is an update on our parking management plan, and the other is just a quick snapshot on the schedule for the comprehensive long-range plan. So with me tonight is um, Allison Fletcher and Tom Brown. They are with Nelson Nygaard, uh, the consultant group that developed our initial parking management plan. And you'll recall back in November, we were here uh, hearing many, many comments, 26 different um, uh, residents and uh, business people commenting about the parking situation. Um, and then uh, you deliberated, I think, uh, uh, further in December and outlined some things that you wanted us to think about on the parking management team. And that team is made up of town staff from planning, from public works, police, and finance. And as we, as the parking management team sat around the table, we said we'd, we'd really like Nelson Nygaard to take a, a look at where we are, what we have implemented, and what the situation is, what has changed, if anything has changed, and how we might proceed, and what would be the impact of implementing some of the ideas that you had put forward back in December. So I'm going to turn it over to Allison, I think, and she'll walk us through where we are. You might want to just pull that a little closer. <laughs> sure. Uh, thanks, Marcia. Um, again, I'm Allison, um, and we just wanted to step back in terms of comparing what we had found, we're, we're looking primarily at Concord Center here. We were asked to address um, issues that are happening there. Um, so we did a comparison apples to apples as much as we possibly could, given there have been some changes in the supply over time um, between what was found in 2012 and what is now there today on the street with what has been implemented. Um, you're probably familiar with the changes because they've come through you, but there's been a number of areas uh, where um, the time limit has changed, where the price has changed, where pay by phone has been implemented either as an accessory option or as the only option given um, what was approved by the Historic Commission. Um, so this is the exact um, evaluation area where we looked. We wanted to look at on-street parking along Main Street, um, looking at Walden Street given that that has some spillover effects and is part of the commercial core here, um, and a couple of the side streets where there has been some spillover issues related to what has happened with pay-by-phone parking on Main Street um, itself, where that is the only option. And we also looked at the Kyes Road lot 
given that there's been some construction on hold there and we've been trying to figure out what would help um, address management issues there, especially given the recent context and data that we have is now six years old. Um, so we walked the site um, as part of our utilization study just to reconfirm the supply. Um, as you can see, and as you're aware here, that there's still metered parking here, metered parking here, and the core has become three hour parking and it's gone to one hour, or one dollar an hour. Um, and then parking west of Sudbury Road on Main Street has become pay by phone only. Um, and we collected uh, a full day of data um, to understand how patterns have happened over the course of the day, which you can see in the, um, the chart that is up here. Um, it follows a very similar bell curve to what we see in many communities and what we saw when we were evaluating here in 2012. Demand tends to be highest in the middle of the day when you have um, the confluence of employees being here, people coming to have lunch, um, people doing the regular business in town. Um, there's a very similar demand pattern overall in terms of about 55% of spaces are full and that was sort of the same in the data um, when we evaluated the similar spaces in 2012. Um, what we've seen that has changed um, and we're trying to evaluate you know, the success of what has been implemented or not um, based on how it's been rolled out, we're seeing something you don't want to see um, in your downtown which is having um, an increase in demand in the heart here, right at the corner of Walden and at Main, um, the pink lines there indicate that the demand is over 90% on those given blocks, which means that it is beyond functionally full. We wanna have typically below 85%, so you, when you're driving down the street looking for a space, you see one or two empty spaces on those blocks. Um, and what we're seeing further is that west of Sudbury Street, as people had reported at the last meeting, there, it's almost completely vacant most of the day, um, except for where the bagged meters are by the library, which at some points in the day is over 100% full. So that's mm -hmm. very full. Um, so there needs to be some way to address that, but not necessarily. We want to take into um, account all the comments that we received. Um, so how to create a balance between this demand, because this is not what we, this is not the indicators of a performing and balanced uh, parking system here. Um, so we discussed with Marsha, had multiple meetings to discuss what would work here and what we had heard from you and what we had heard from the public to discuss what um, proposed system um, could potentially address this, knowing this is going to be an iterative process going forward as well in terms of you need to continue to evaluate demand in the future. Uh, what we think, given the demand patterns that we're seeing today um, and how the system is functioning, that this suite of recommendations will help uh, mitigate the issues we've been having and um, address many of the public concerns and keep the largest group of people happy here while still making spaces available to customers who are coming here to Concord Center. So what we have recommended is that west of Sudbury Road, the areas that have been pay by phone spaces only, that those become free and unregulated spaces um, to free up availability along those blocks. If the town observes over time that demand becomes a problem along these blocks given this you know, over a repeated period that, you know, an initial thing you could do is to deploy time limits um, to encourage people not to stay there all day. Um, and that could be a conversation in terms of what those are. Where there are um, bags on the meter um, right by the library near the corner of Sudbury in Maine, we would recommend removing those meters that are not being used, um, making those free. But because it is an area of such high demand with the library, making that a longer term period um, with three hour time limit there for people to be able to come and do their library business um, and then they can park in the unregulated spaces that they'd like to stay for a longer period of the day. Um, we would recommend that what has been implemented in the core and along Walden Street stay as it has been implemented, um, same price, same regulation, um, and given the other recommendations here that we have, we expect that the demand would balance itself out um, here. And then Marsha also asked us to look at uh, what are the plans for Walden and said for the Kai Street lot um, and given we're trying to create availability and more options for people we discussed and we believe that we can keep the lots there free um, with no time limit for the foreseeable future but again a similar condition to what um, I described west of Sudbury on Main Street to continue evaluating if the demand gets to the point that it's a consistent problem um, a first step would be to look at options for implementing time limits first and then potentially pricing further down the road, but not in the near future given the demand patterns we're seeing on Main Street today. So 
So I did prepare a, a memo for you, and uh, um, these recommendations are all outlined on the second page. The last item is a holdover from another memo, so okay. just ignore the final one. Um, to clarify, though, for the Walden Street lot, we're going to create three-hour parking and um, all-day parking. So um, there, the, we are not going to lose any parking spaces in the redesigned mm -hmm. parking lot at Walden Street, um, but there will be some additional spaces around the periphery, and that lot will be reconstructed this summer, um, not at the same time as Kai's Road. And Kai's Road would be redeveloped in two phases, first the east side, then the west side. Um, and the, there will be a, an increase in the number of spaces by three that we'll be proposing for that Kai's Road lot. The town engineer has uh, prepared plans. They're out to bid. Uh, he expects to have the contract signed fairly soon and we'll let business owners and um, residents know when that construction is going to be taking place this summer. Um, so it probably July and August. Questions? Is there communication with Concord Academy about um, sort of the usage of their land for their employees? We did not. We had some informal conversations with Don Kingman as a representative for Concord Academy um, to understand what changes they had implemented. Uh, as a result of in um, putting park, uh, pay by phone in place. And it was in response to that, uh, their actions that we felt that it was important to um, remove the pay by phone signs along Main Street, um, but to keep monitoring that and to have a conversation. I will, uh, I, I told the town manager that I would follow up with Mr. Kingman tomorrow after this meeting. And um, since, it, I think Concord Academy's um, parking impacts was one one piece, and then I think we've also I've heard discussion of the impact of um, commuters who were availing themselves of long-term yes. parking. How does that factor into? I think that's something we're going to have to monitor. Okay. I think I think there is a need for both worker housing and commuter housing, right. and that we may see more spaces being utilized. Um, at that end of, uh, of Main Street, closest to Thoreau Street, mm -hmm. for the businesses along Thoreau Street. Um, we're not proposing, we didn't study, didn't look at Thoreau Street or West Concord because we didn't hear the same level of complaints uh, that we were hearing about Concord Center. So if, if it comes forward that we need to take a second look at those spaces, we can do that. Um, and as uh, Allison said, I think it's going to be an iterative process that we will continue to monitor and as we observe what is happening, we'll try to make adjustments to all of this. So, oh, oh, go ahead. Maybe, uh, no. I was going, you probably know more about this than I do. I doubt it. This is, um, <laughs> we continue to receive correspondence from the Main Street business sector who are engaged in trying to figure out, do we actually need parking meters at all in the very downtown business area. There, there is a very strong feeling that parking meters um, are a disincentive for people to shop. And so I, I think I remember the conversations that Nelson and I guard had presented to Allison at a meeting that seemed to indicate that it promoted greater turnover of parking so that more people could come to an area. And that's not what the businesses are reporting is happening. So I don't know whether you have additional information. There, are being shown most recently some uh, photographs of other communities near us who have done away with all the parking meters in the downtown business district because there were concerns that that was in, impeding the foot traffic and people's ability to shop in all the places they want to shop. So I didn't know if, it was, if that's a philosophy difference and that if you have any information that you can help us in figuring out what the, you know, where the businesses benefit most. I, I think you heard from Maynard Forbes about West Concord that he was adamantly opposed to removing the meters oh. because they would be taken over by commuters. And I think the same would be true on your main streets, um, com commuters or workers. Uh, we are, in, as, we, as businesses do grow or, or we have additional employees, employees want to park where it's convenient for them, which isn't always the most convenient for the customers. Um, so I think this is something that we should continue to monitor 
and you might try some different tactics in terms of maybe bagging the meters for a Saturday or well, we to do. promote. The, you did it around Christmas for the yeah, in did. December. You did, mm -hmm. and those might be the kinds of things we can. I think we need to promote where we can have where we do have free parking, um, and that it will be all day. I think um, that that would be very beneficial and make it available both as a, a, a guide that is a piece of paper that is available in, in the shops as well as online. And that's another step that we're working toward. Well, there continues to be a split in the business community. Yeah. It, it's mm -hmm. almost down the middle. I just uh, thank you very much. I think you did hear from us and most of the things that we had right. thought were important you undertaken to change, and I'm grateful for that. Along Main Street, though, where it's pay by phone now, and we're taking that out, well, that, and there's no time limit, is that going to make that all day parking? Is that yes. the intent? Yes. But yes. For it's, it's, it's the employees that you're looking for, though, not commuters. It could be commuters. students, it could be employees, it could be commuters. It, if, if, if a commuter wants to park there and walk over to the train station, I say, why not? Um, it's it has two effects. It's taking advantage of what we have, the pavement that we already have in existence and mm -hmm. the line striping we already have. And it's not creating any additional burden um, in terms of having to have a parking lot somewhere. But when we went to, when we went to paid parking along that strip, it moved the Concord folks off the street. Correct. Um, Concord Academy folks. Hmm? Con Concord Academy right. folks off the street. Does this just bring them back to the street? It may bring them back, but it will take them off of Academy Lane. Um, I think Academy Lane is a, a much narrower, more mm -hmm. residential feel to it. Um, and there's been some question about the safety of people walking oh, I, through that I agree. area. That's so tight. Um, that I agree. It's tied in that middle be street important. and Academy Lane. Those are I think that that's a conversation that we need to continue with Concord mm -hmm. Academy. And um, I'll open up that conversation tomorrow. I, I would also hope that we look into perhaps uh, making sure we have plenty of bike racks so that <laughs> if people want an alternative to uh, commuting that the bikes can be used. And, and I think the other thing that I've, I've heard is that the commuter parking, if there's only a six month um, uh, sort of ticket uh, or permit that we probably need to try to work a way that uh, that can be daily or weekly or something so that uh, people be more inclined to, to park uh, in, in that location where they need the permit. We've had uh, three successful years of working with um, Evergreen Realty, the owners mm -hmm. of Stop and Sh or Crosby's Market Lots, <laughs> Your age Stop and Shop, yeah. <laughs> uh, and and um, I think it would be worth a conversation to look at uh, a solar powered a kiosk that right. might allow for that daily, and you then stick to my ears. I know <laughs> I, I, we heard you loud and clear. We I were wish, listening. I wish we could <laughs> make. I wish we could make some progress on that. I'm sorry. I wish we could make some progress on that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also, the it's a small lot, but there's a lot that's behind the uh, church over here, the uh, Christian Science Church. Christian I think Science, it is, yes. That is packed when they're having their church services, right. but otherwise it's. They have Empty. agreements with the Colonial Inn and others about that parking lot, um, so I, I would have to, we'd have to negotiate with them. There's also going to be a map, as I understand, right. right? Which I think is going to help a lot of us understand where all of the parking options right. exist. And as Tom said, music to my ears, the bike racks. Um, but how are, what's the timing of this iterative process with the publication of where to go and how long you can stay? Um, I think we can uh, implement that, the signage and the, re the removal of the pay by phone this summer. Okay. Um, I will have to coordinate with uh, Public Works on the signage and to find out how best to get the posts in place because they don't have a stockpile of posts. So I might have to uh, get those ordered, working through finance to make sure we have the funds to do that. Um, and then we're also in the process of trying to brand um, Concord Center so that we have a consistent logo uh, with our parking information. And that's in the works and mm -hmm. we're working with the Historic Districts Commission on all, all of that. Um, street furniture, including bike racks and, and that sort of thing. I've, I've had a preliminary conversation with the HDC about 
um, the need for it, and we'd like to have it um, consistent throughout Concord Center uh, and approved by the Historic Districts Commission where we haven't gotten there yet, so uh, we'll, that's gonna be a work in progress and I'll have to report back on that. The other, the other uh, parking issue that we heard, particularly from the business community, was bus parking yes. and bus drop off. And how is that right. coming? Well, I think we we've, um, have the temporary bus parking near the Wright Tavern, and that has worked out very successfully, and I believe that that will be an ongoing location for drop off. Um, with the redesign of the Kyes Road parking lot, there uh, will be a specific location for one or two buses to park in the lot, as well as to drop uh, um, well, my, my remark when I, I remember talking to you about this some time ago, I don't remember exactly when, but it was months ago, but my hope was that there was a drop-off area for buses, but we didn't, there's lots of places buses can park that are not right in the downtown area, so my hope was that there were drop-off spots that we could have some, make it look like a nice drop-off spot, whatever that means, I don't exactly know. But we didn't necessarily have them parking there. We could. We wouldn't be looking for all day parking, but sometimes a bus will drop people off, take a little tour, and then have to come back, and they're waiting for people to get back yeah, on the but bus. But so. also, it could be the case that they're here for a couple hours, and let's move them yes. someplace else so they're not. So, great. Well, thanks so very much. I just have three uh, small things I want to ask about. One is with the bus. Um, Spot in, is it in front of First Parish near Wright Tavern? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, someone should look at that sign again because I had an occasion uh, with someone else to be uh, trying to find a parking spot in that area, and there were two different, three different inf uh, interpretations of what that sign which was trying to say. <laughs> okay. So that one thing I want to point out. Um, someone just needs to remind me the spots around the corner. Um, from Walden, uh, around the corner by the post office. Hubbard Street. H Hubbard Street, thank you. Um, remind me why no parking is now allowed in those three spots on the closest to the post office. Um, it, it wasn't, the, the road isn't wide enough. Um, when you have trucks trying to make that turn into or out of, uh, if you had parking on both sides of the street, it was, it was problematic. Sounds like West Concord. <laughs> yeah. um, and then the, t thank you for uh, the um, pay by phone um, parking spots. What is the plan in terms of making the changeover? Are you gonna immediately take out the meters? Or are you gonna cover them for a while to see how it works or? I think, I think the, the proposal is to take out the 12 meters that are next to the library entirely and add signage that says three hour parking. That I understand, but and further the, down. And for the pay by phone, the pay by phone only signs that continue down Main Street just to remove just those pay by phone signs. And to add you know, parking you know, uh, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. or something along those lines. Uh, but not to and say. And then do we retain those so that if we have to put them back in at some point? We Ooh. probably will. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I save everything. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was uh, quite an update. We appreciate that. A lot of good information. Very helpful. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Now, I had a second update uh, for the comprehensive long range plan. Yes. Just, just a scheduling thing, uh, item. Um, we're in the final oh, stages. Um, just, I think we have a comment. I don't know that we want to wait. Somebody wants to comment. The woman. The woman wants to comment. Make a comment. Oh, if you want to make a comment, come forward. Hi. Hi. First of all, I was here in November, and the whole room was filled for the. Identify oh, yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Mary Weinberg. I live at Hillside Avenue in West Concord. I think it's close to 40 years now. Um, so I don't know if I'm a Concordian yet. But um, I was here in November, and um, I thank Masha. She's fantastic. I don't know how she does it, but she looks younger and younger. And she was, <laughs> so I was here that night, and I'm embarrassed to say, but I don't have a cell phone. I don't own one. And um, I was concerned because when I saw the pay-by phone on Main Street, um, 
I felt sad because um, well, I have friends that al live along there, but besides being an eyesore, I was sad because I can't park there. So my question to the board that night was, uh, can we do this? Can we put up something that eliminates certain people? Um, and that night there were a few people that said it in different ways. One woman stood up and said she works with a lot of aged people who are probably my age in the 70s who have trouble working their cell phone. Um, and there were different people that commented. So um, I'm happy to see they're going to be taken out. But what I, I didn't hear tonight, which if you ever have time to, to discuss, what will we do in the future? Will, if we do put pay by phone in, will we have an alternative to use cash, a kiosk or something? I think I, when I go to Lexington, there's no place in Lexington where I don't have the alternative to pay cash. They have a big parking lot with somebody monitoring it. And, uh, and it's friendly. And I love this town. And I've spent a lot of money here. But I think I mentioned to the town manager, I really couldn't afford coming in. When I come in, I come in. And, I, and unfortunately, I spend money. And uh, three hours is not enough for me. <laughs> and uh, same thing in West Concord. Uh, Deborah's in the five and ten, and a dollar an hour. You know, you sit in Deborah's and you eat and you buy and you go to West Concord. And anyway, th my qu my thing was, could you all discuss what do we do about this? Will it be a warrant article that if we ever do put a pay by phone, there'll always be a way for people who don't have phones to pay by cash? A warrant article. Um, the other thing was I wanted to ask, and but I thank you for taking them away on Main Street. Um, is there an alternative in the West Concord commuter parking lot? Um, it says that the town has implemented pay by phone service to West Concord commuter parking lot. Is this a, is there an alternative way to pay in that parking lot with cash? I'm just asking this because it wasn't down here, and Marsha probably knows the answer. As I, as I pointed out to the uh, select board, the, that is a, a holdover from a prior memo. Mm -hmm. um, there is, uh, it is only for out-of-town residents. Um, Concord residents have the option of having a placard and paying with cash um, here in town. Right. So it's okay. only for out-of-town people who, uh, who are using the state-owned spaces where they have to use pay by phone. And if one was to use it once or twice, would I come beforehand and, and pay? You know, if I went to the station and used the train, would I have to come into town to get my pass, you know, for that one day? Um, we don't have day passes oh. right now. It is six months. Oh. So. so what happens, how can I take the train if once in a while I want to take the train in? Good question. We don't have that option, but I'll, we'll look okay. into that. Well, okay. <laughs> okay. Since I gave four years of my life to turn it into a public train station, <laughs> as you see, I never use it, but I did it because everybody wanted it to be a public train station. So I'm kind of asking a funny question, but um, I think it's important. But I thank you all. Progress and that's yes. Good. Yes. Well, thank God. Thank, thank you, you and thank you. Okay. I have one more question later for the next item. Thank you. All right. Just quickly, the yes. comprehensive long-range plan, we're in the final phases. Uh, the consultant has delivered uh, a final draft to our co-chairs, Elise Woodward and Gary Kleiman. They will be incorporating board and committee comments. That's going back to the comprehensive long-range plan committee by uh, June 22nd uh, to approve that final language. Then it goes to the back to the consultant for a final view um, and scheduled for the July 10th planning board meeting where they hopefully will uh, approve or adopt and recommend to you that you adopt the plan. So hopefully this will be a scheduled item for later in July before the select board. Great. Thank Thank you. You. That'll be exciting. Look forward to it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're ready to review and amend West Concord Advisory Committee charge. I think has been distributed to all of us in the package. Uh, didn't look like an enormous. I was, I was, I kept looking for big changes. <laughs> well, I think it changes who will appoint. Yeah. 
Yes, that, that's the significance. A lot of it is otherwise it's um, changing, yeah. changing with the times and our new name. Changing our name. Like so I don't know that there's much discussion. I don't think that there's any need to unless people want to discuss something. No. Well, otherwise, you, gotta, I think you, you have a hand up again. Do you have a hand up? Oh, please come forward. Yes. Thank you. I'll try to be fast. Again, I was. Just, oh. Record have to identify. Yeah. Um, redundant. But Mary Weinberg, Hillside Avenue, in West Concord. Uh, I was um, an associate member, non-voting, on the first West Concord Advisory Committee. I was asked by one of the members because of my history in the 80s of working a lot in West Concord. Um, I just noticed on the membership requirements and expectations. I don't know if it exists already, because I haven't been involved in the last five or six years, but I st strongly recommended that the board consider um, that the seven, mem m seven members will be recommended by the planning board come from green cards. Okay. So come from green card submissions so it's more democratic and transparent. And then there'd be a lot of publicity out so that people can write in why they want to be on, what their history is, what they want to give to it. And that would be good. Okay, thank you. I think we can encourage that without necessarily incorporating it within the document. I agree. Yeah, I think that's an administrative process. Yeah. yeah. Um, so okay. Ready? Yeah. Yep. I believe green cards are involved. Always have the press. Have green yes. cards. Yeah. 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 Uh, move to amend the West Concord Advisory Committee charges drafted and revised. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Now we are moving to review and approve the Climate Action Advisory Board draft charge. <laughs> So this, uh, I'll just introduce this. Yes. Um, we discussed this at a previous board meeting. We had an, a number of uh, public comments that we were taken. Yeah. So um, this, and I was asked to revise yes. the charge based on the comments that we have right. received. So I think I have done that um, in this version and have met with town staff, um, the assistant town manager, the only thing I, I received today, one comment that uh, is worth uh, considering that would be a slight modification to this, and I think we can approve this with the amendment. Mm -hmm. um, under membership, it says at least one representative recommended by the former EFTF. And I think that that is probably not um, administratively doable. The committee doesn't exist and they can't recommend. Mm -hmm. So the, rec the, I would, the proposed language, I would see here is um, at least one member of the former EFTF be on this committee. Hmm. Because the, the former EFTF no longer meets unless we ask them to convene for one meeting to come up with recommendations to present we, to the We couldn't board. even do that. Yeah, I mean, sense. it's been dissolved so as a it, committee. It seems like what I think that the intent sense. was is that the voice oh, of the I'm EFTF be represented on this new sustainability, the Climate Action Committee. So we're really one former member. W well, yes. Yeah. So at least that. one former member of the EFTF or one member of the former EFTF. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whichever. It's, former for there, yeah. <laughs> it's there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're puzzled, Jane. I'm, I'm looking at the, the, the timeline on the Climate Action Advisory Board, which is open-ended. It's a, you know, it's a, um, Essentially, it would be like a standing. A standing committee, exactly. And so that's the only concern I have is whether or not um, we are going to run out of former members of the EFTF yeah. in terms of, you know, obliging but that. We can, so I think we can amend the charge. We when, can do that right. if, if it right. turns I'm out just, to be the case. Right. We could amend it at some time in the future to right. strike that clause from the mm -hmm. charter. I agree. Mm -hmm. 
So I think that was, so I'm not sure if there are other thoughts or comments. That was the one that I received today after this was posted um, on our website. But I'm Anybody ready. else comments? Is there comments? Ready for a motion? Wait, no, we have comments. Yeah, comment. Public comment, yes, please. Laurie Gilpazaris, 1376, whoops, Old Marlboro Road in Concord. And I want to uh, thank Alice and the uh, Sustainability Department for further working on this charge. I know it was a lot of work, and I think that you have shown by including things like Article 23 in this that we are truly um, adaptable, <laughs> and also we work in a, a spirit of continuous improvement, and I think those are important as we go forward to meet the uncertainty of climate change. Um, I think that, that it's, you've made major strides here, and I only have a few suggestions that I'm sorry I couldn't, I wasn't able to access my computer, or my computer was not cooperating over the we weekend, so I didn't see this until today. Um, and I have some suggestions that may make this charge even stronger. Uh, I think an important point is that it's comprehensive, and by looking at everything at one time, I think this is the best way that we can go about facing the future. Um, under, uh, let's see, so the charge refers to the uh, advisory board working with CSEC and other uh, town committees and boards and so forth. And I'm wondering if it would make sense to include uh, working, and I understand, and understand that Jane is the liaison to the, the MAGIC uh, group, mm -hmm. but uh, there's specific committees and work going on with the MAGIC group that are focused on climate. Mm -hmm. And so does it make sense to have this board uh, also work with or, or with the magic climate component of the group? I have a suggestion, Tom. I, I'm not, um, I don't want to consider these uh, on the fly. Uh-huh. Uh, I'd be so more my, than glad my to. My preference would be that if you would write to the board, okay. to Alice. I, I'm perfectly uh, happy with doing that. I apologize then, again that I didn't have. We could then decide whether or not we would want to amend okay. the charter going forward. All right. Forward. So I, w I, there, I have four uh, suggestions, yeah. and I'd be more Sending than happy along, I can do that and get it to you tomorrow. So you, I'd like to hear just like two things. It, magic was one. I think we addressed everything else that you had um, submitted in writing well, before. I was wondering about the mus municipal vulnerability preparedness um, team and ha how that will integrate with this committee. So we because we don't have that team, nor do we have a we grant. Don't, well, well, we're working toward we're it. We're working so toward it. So it's a future. So what this so, says is other town committees okay. and boards. And I thought that that's what? Not knowing what that committee would be right, or what the right. charge would be, but that is inherent in sustainability practices. Right, okay. Um, so, you know, other considerations like building in language on cost effectiveness and things like yeah, that I might be appropriate. The, uh, you know, committee gets going in uh -huh. the Absolutely. It, it's pretty general. Yeah. phrased and, and you use the right language um, but there was there were one or two other considerations that I'll put in a, a memo to you so I appreciate everything you're doing I think for that late this to town is, uh, is really on board with climate um, so, so I move I move to approve the climate action advisory board charge as amended this evening by Alice second no, second second favor no. aye, aye. aye. Very much. Now we review and amend comprehensive sustainable energy committee charge. Um, so this is again a revision from the last discussion with on uh, the CSEC um, uh, charge that broadens their frame of reference and moves it a little beyond just the work in energy, but also capitalizes on some of the things that they do well for the town and would add a, a, an additive function for the sustainability department, which is working um, in the area of communications and marketing, working with the schools, working to broaden the impact and engagement across the town on issues of sustainability. No, I, thought um, those were, yeah. I thought those were good. Yeah. They become sort of an, an outreach committee, which is incredibly yeah. important. 
Um, so I think that this incorporates the comments that we heard from uh, the CSEC at the time um, chair, and it includes the town staff comments as well. Mm -hmm. I do have one small concern about it though, Alice, yeah. and that is that some of that outreach kind of stuff is, um, has uh, monetary implications. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make sure we're not in the, putting them in the position of uh, wanting to come back to the town and then request funds to support what they're doing. So I think that if there's particular things to be done, it's recommending them to the town and letting the town staff deal with them rather than uh, providing them with directly with funds to do that. Mm -hmm. I think that's, mm -hmm. uh, would you I, agree, uh, Chris? I, uh, yeah. that I know that's always been sense. a tension because it, the Sawyer Trust was so long, for so long was um, a, a, a tool that was put to work with, with CSEC recommendations. So I'm trying to figure out where, where it's missing. It says to work closely with the Concord Sustainability Director and other town boards to assist in the, measure, uh, the town in measuring greenhouse gas emissions. Um, is it to develop a variety of tools to educate the public about the importance of the benefits of sustainable energy practices? I'm, I'm looking at where we need well, to- those kind of, those, those So is for it an example. overarching statement you're looking for maybe? Well, I'm not even, I just want it on the record. Uh, yeah, the, okay. The, no, the language needs to be No, adjusted. I don't think, okay. Okay. no, I don't think the language needs to be adjusted. I just think it's important to convey to them that-, yeah. that They this, won't have an operating budget. They won't have an operating budget. Right. Mm -hmm. And they'll work with the town for any of the right. projects that they were. And it does mm -hmm. say to do some short-term and long-term planning with the sustainability yeah. department. Good. Right. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Ready for the motion? I move to amend the Comprehensive Sustainable Energy Committee charge as drafted. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Um, we are now uh, at the um, request for the marker of Ste uh, Sleepy Hollow. Sleepy Hollow Cemetery, Friends of Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. Alice wrote me a, an email stating that they wish to, uh, Friends of Sleepy Hollow proposed to install a stone honoring longtime members of the Friends of Sleepy Hollow, uh, Hollow Cemetery. The cemetery committee supports this as members have donated time, money, and thought to preserving and enhancing public spaces within the ground, in particular as a garden space at the entrance of the ground. Um, we looked into it. I, we hadn't done this before. It seemed like a good idea. And I think the, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, we do not need necessarily, this is something that can be done. <coughs> That, that's right. Um, I meant my email mentions that um, we've allowed plaques to be installed out front. There's the um, the, um, the garden club puts yeah. has a, flag, a plaque there, and, and that's not really a na naming practice. So we really do sparingly name buildings or even rooms within buildings after individuals. Um, but having a plaques. In this one just <laughs> thanks the garden club for the gift. Yeah. It, it, that, well, it actually says this: the garden is a gift of the Garden Club. Um, the Anderson property. There's a marker. For, I think I put the almost this far away. There's a marker at, on the um, at Rideout, the new additional mm -hmm. acre that was added to Rideout that notes the Anderson family presence. Um, we on the Barrett Mill Farm. Um, also, that family, the McGrath family, there's a recognition there. So, it, the APP doesn't say who should authorize plaques. So that might we might want to update the APP to say. If you want to install a plaque, it requires the board's approval or, or something like that. But um, it's a, uh, a little easier to do that than to have the na uh, naming. Are we setting precedent also, friends of you know all organizations in town will want to? So it does. Um, it, it, some of it has gone on, uh, and it will continue. It seems like you know one or two a year are, are mounted on the, the water. There's a water bubbler uh, on the square that's been that was dedicated to an individual. There's a, a recognition for a former track coach at the high school at uh, Emerson at the Emerson track. There's a plaque that was put in 
Well, the 30, BD Center has ago. a long list of names associated with the BD so Center. So BD Center was yeah. named after a donor, oh, and, that, and, right. um, and then you know um, that was an intentional. That was an, a substantial gift that was made, and um, so that was done. Um, so this is a this this um, plaque would be, an in honor of time that. That different residents have, have given to volunteer. friends of a particular couple who donated uh, time and money and labor to develop a, this garden as you enter Sleepy Hollow. So it's not additive. There won't be other names added to it. It's I one don't plaque. Think so. I think it was two individuals. Two individuals of the friends of Sleepy Hollow who took care to develop this garden, plant it every year, nurture it, grow it. Yeah. Um, and the funding for the little plaque or whatever is going to be from um, the friends, friends of Sleepy Hollow. So. so it seems appropriate. Yeah. This is more of an information. Anybody have any strong objections to it? I, I know you're concerned about the precedent. Well, I'm concerned but. about the precedent. Yeah. And, and, but I think what we should do is if we have an administrative policy that sets out a process for how this is done. So um, my preference would be is there any real downside if we postponed it for a couple of weeks and, and at the next meeting dealt with whatever administrative policy there is? Or a, I'm, I don't want to get in the way of it. I know that in two weeks we could we could um, prepare a revision to APP 33 that you could take a look at. Um, I don't, I, but I, I haven't dealt uh, with Alice, are you thinking it would be better just to go ahead with this and then pick up the administrative policy next time and get that, it squared that would away? Be my recommendation. I understand, you know, what your intent is. I think that we should approve this as is. It fits the guidelines. We have, we have an okay that it's okay for us to do in this precedent already, and for us now to move forward and look at APP 43. Right. Okay. We all comfortable with that? Sure. I don't think we need to take a vote. We just uh, sort of a sense of we yeah. move ahead on that then. But it, it, but it is also the sense that we want to get the, the APP in line with yeah. where we are. Yep. Okay. Okay. We now uh, schedule for the 2019 annual town meeting dates. Whoa. Really? <laughs> well. Give me a break. This is way earlier than normal, but the school uh, folks have requested in the interest of um, to, um, determining who's going to use the um, school facilities next April. Um, if you want to hold it for the second week of April, um, they need to know whether the, the town meeting will be held at then. I don't think we need to develop the whole schedule, right. but it's really just, are, is, are we going to be at the high school the second week of, of April? That's April 8, 9, 10, and 11 if we go to the four days. So. And we did check religious holidays I, uh, to make sure we're not we running into conflicts there. did. Um, let's see. Uh, Heather, I think, did check. I'm trying to remember who did that, but I think Heather checked that. So yeah, April nine. Eight. 8, 9, 10, 11. April. Normally, we approve the schedule around the first week of August. Well, so. Sunday is the 14th. April Fool's Day is on April 1st. <laughs> oh. uh, Good Friday on the 19th. Passover 20th, Fine. Easter 21st. Okay. So the 18th, is that uh, the, the select board and Acton won't be able to meet? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> April 8th to the 12th or 11th? Yes. Looks like we're, I don't see, at least on my iCalc, doesn't show any conflicts with religious holidays. Diane, are you aware of any? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Defer to the town manager on that. One, we, um, 
we held town meeting the last week of uh, April for many, many years, mostly because the former finance director felt strongly that he needed that much time to prepare the, the budget, the FinCom report, um, and other documents associated with um, with it, and he didn't want to be um, pushing into the um, Christmas holidays, frankly, to start his publication preparation. So um, we, I think it was last year, we agreed to try the second week. The staff has found it more helpful that when we had town meeting the fourth week of April, the third week of April, school vacation, and school folks just weren't around um, to help with the facilities, for budgeting, for all kinds of issues, we found that uh, there was no one there, and it was Monday morning of town meeting is when, you know, when we'd get answers to our questions on facilities, that sort of thing. So I think the staff found that it was very helpful to meet the second, um, uh, the second week because the school staff are still there bef uh, before school vacations happen. I think it may have felt a little rushed. I think there was some compression in the hearing schedule, um, and it may be that now that we, if, we, if you decide on this date, and again, it's at the request of the school staff, administration to know when it's going to be, we can perhaps schedule the public hearings in a manner that's a, a little bit more spread out. I can only say as a, as a parent of kids still in school and as someone who continuously encourages a sector of Concord that rarely shows up in ma en masse to town meeting, anything that we do that uh, increases the likelihood of, of that yeah, I just I can't imagine that being a good a good choice, even though you know later maybe give a lot of comfort in terms of timing to get there. Piling on right after spring spring break, just I don't think we're going to see anybody. I'm wondering whether I <clears throat> Linda had mentioned that it would be helpful to her to know uh, that if we were going to. Um, have only one meeting in August, uh, which meeting that would be. Um, I assume it would be more likely to be the August 13th one rather than the 27th, but uh, I don't know if people have preferences, and we may have to meet both times, but uh, I think the hope is we can probably do with just one. It doesn't matter. Pick one. Anybody Hasn't it, that been our, our Did you practice? Have a preference as to which one? Uh, I know I can't be at the 13th. 13th, okay. So then. But that, you know, then. No, but uh, that, I mean, if it's all, you know, all the same to everybody else, uh, we can accommodate. <laughs> so the 13th. Maybe too early to determine, you know. Well, the only, but yeah, the point would be, though, if we were going to cancel one, we could do that. We, that would be our priority is to cancel that one. So that. Comfortable with you? Sure. Okay. I don't think we have to do anything with that at that point. Are we setting the date for town meeting or are we just indicating our? Um, well, I'm hoping that you'll vote to yeah. um, plan for the 2019 annual town meeting uh, the second. Uh, Beginning the eight, April 8th. Yeah. Yeah. to 11th. Yeah. And, and we'll give you a more full schedule to vote on probably in July. Okay. With the, with the public hearings and the snow cancellation dates and all that. Need to take a vote on that, do you think? Or? Okay. Yes, we do. Yes. <coughs> do we have oh, a it's motion? Eighth, to ninth, tenth, and eleventh. Eleventh, mm -hmm. if necessary. Mm -hmm. I move to set the dates for the 2019 annual town meeting as April 9th, 10th, 11th. Eighth, eighth, ninth, eighth. tenth, and eleventh. Second. Second. All those right in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. <laughs> Four consecutive numbers beyond me. I <clears throat> Public comments. <laughs> Okay, Anybody uh, left? Once that again, that lasted <laughs> the public pretty well. Except, uh, oh dear. Uh, uh, committee liaison. Uh, uh, in the interest of time, I think we, I would suggest we postpone them to our next meeting. I think excellent idea. <laughs> uh, why don't we then move any miscellaneous or correspondence people want to comment on? I think we've incorporated most of it in our. Well, we note in our notes. packet we yeah. had a we had a. Uh, letter from Mr. Montague. But didn't we discuss yeah. that during the parking? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we didn't discuss his letter. We just uh, okay. acknowledged that we received yeah. it. Yeah. Um, okay, we're ready for committee nominations. Uh, okay. Um, 
I nominate Carol Steele of 52 Sorrow Road to the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail Advisory Committee. Committee appointments. Move to appoint Yanis Tsetsas, or something close, I'm sorry right. if I mispronounced that, at 33 Brook Trail Road to the Concord Housing Development Corporation for a term to expire May 31st, 2021. Dennis Fiore of 309 Strawberry Hill Road and Patricia Nelson of 52 Cottage Lane to the Library Committee for terms to expire May 31st, 2021. Um, and uh, are we also, no. Carol Steele, right, because I think they um, want to move that along. So we're I think they need quorum, right? Doing the yeah, in, in order to quorum? affect quorum. Yep. So then I will also appoint, move to appoint Carol Steele of 52 Sorrow Road to the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail Advisory Committee for a term to expire May 31st, 2021. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Committee reappointments. Move to reappoint Burton Flint um, of 1643 Main Street to the Community Preservation Committee as the planning board designee for a term to expire May 31st, 20, 2019. Um, Hester Schnipper of 631 Main Street to the Con Community Preservation Committee as the Housing Authority designee for a term to expire May 31st, 2020. Peter Ward of 29 Pilgrim Road to the, committee, to, to the Community Preservation Committee as the Recreation Commission designee for a term to expire May 31st, 2019. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Confirm town manager's administrative appointments. Move to confirm the town manager appointment of Jerry Frankel of 132 Jenny Dugan Road to the Comprehensive Sustainable Energy Committee for an unexpired term to expire May 31st, 2019. Melissa Salfeld of 7 Concord Green, number 7, to the Historical Commission as a full member for a term to expire May 31st, 2021. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It's nice to see us use Jerry uh, again. Yeah, we're, we're lucky. We are. Um, move to confirm the town manager appointment of Carrie Lafer, the town treasurer, town collector, Patricia Robert Robertson, deputy treasurer and collector, Kari Tari, the town clerk, Patricia Clifford, assistant town clerk, and Anderson Krieger, LLP, town council, all for ter terms to expire May 31st, 2019. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I move to adjourn to executive session for the purposes of discussing land acquisition, the Jero land, and not to reconvene an open session. The executive session is needed to protect strategy discussions affecting uh, real estate matters. And, and could I mention there's two parcels we want to, we want to talk about, the Jero land and then a second unnamed yeah. parcel. And a second parcel. Second. Uh, we need to do that in roll call. Aye. 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 Thank you. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank goodness we started a little bit earlier.